to the Calaveras County Board of Supervisors meeting for um, Tuesday, March 27th. Madam Clerk. Item one, conference with legal counsel, anticipated litigation, significant exposure to litigation, two cases pursuant to government code section 54956.9D2. Any public comment on this item? Seeing none, we will retire to closed session. All right, if we can find seats, please. I think there's some up front here in the front row. The whole front row almost. All right, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Calaveras County Board of Supervisors meeting for Tuesday, March 27th. May we all rise and pledge the allegiance to our flag. Madam Clerk, can you please lead us? Let us begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Chair. Madam Clerk. No heckling from the audience. <laughs> Report of closed session. Conference with legal counsel, anticipated litigation, ex significant exposure to litigation, two cases, pursuant to government code section 54956.9D2. There was no reportable action taken. All right, moving on to item. The next item on the agenda, announcements. Announcements. This is a time for board members and county staff to provide updates of upcoming county events that may be of interest to the public. Does any board member have anything to announce? Any staff member? Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Kristen Brinks, Health and Human Services. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to recognize the retirement of John Lawless, the Health and Human Services Agency <laughs> Deputy Director. <laughs> He's a fan too, John. Um, and I just wanted to recognize um, John has been here since September of 2014. He's been such a dedicated member of the executive leadership team of Health and Human Services. Um, he served as our mental health director. He's been instrumental in bringing about um, programs that were recognized at the state level, integrated dual diagnosis treatment. He's been instrumental in opening a um, transitional living environment for those engaged in their mental health recovery plans. He's helped um, bring about the mental health court program. And so I just wanted to take some time to recognize his contributions to our community and um, thank him for all his years of service. Thank you. Any other staff member? Judy Hawkins, Human Resources and Risk Director. Good morning, Chair, members of the board. I am here this morning to invite you to our Wagon Walk program. Um, this program was, the idea was brought to me in November of 2016 by Mike Magana, he contacted my office saying that the uh, animal shelter needed assistance with uh, walking their dogs. So uh, Deborah Showman, with the uh, assistance of Henning, uh, our manager at the animal shelter, came up with this program. There are some requirements to this program, which is attending a two-hour training with uh, of one of our volunteers who teaches you how to um, socialize the dogs. But this idea is to get our employees, and this program is for employees only, out of their offices at lunchtime and um, socialize our animals. Walk the dogs, sit, pet the cats, 
And the idea is to, we know that um, studies have shown that um, spending time with the animals releases stress, brings down high blood pressure, and it's a great opportunity for both our employees and our four-legged friends at the animal shelter. So I do invite you to join this program. I also want to remind our employees out there that this program is available, and this is a perfect time of year to start. All right. Thank you, Judy. Good morning, Laura Larson from Calaveras County Health and Human Service Agency. Celebrated each year in March is Social Worker Appreciation. March is an opportunity to turn the spotlight onto social workers and highlight the important contributions they make to our community. Calvary's County social workers confront some of the most challenging issues facing individuals and families, and through leadership and advocacy, they champion for families while forging solutions to some of their challenges. Health and Human Service Agency is thankful for the commitment and tireless work performed by social workers throughout the county, but especially during the month of March, we give pause and celebrate all social workers and the contributions they make to our families and the individuals they serve. So I'd like to thank all the social workers um, who work for the county. I would also like to take a, take a quick moment um, to speak to John Lawless. The best way to describe John is like a gentle breeze that blows a sailboat through the water. In the, in the short time I've worked with John, I most appreciated his approach to handling tough situations. John was calm and gentle when providing guidance, but always supportive. I would like to wish John a happy retirement and thank him for his um, work with the county. Thank you. Any other staff? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, item number two. Item number two is from the Ag Department to receive a presentation from Calaveras 4-H. Good morning, Kevin. Good morning. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce this item to the Board of Supervisors today. The 4-H is an organization that teaches our children principles of living through hands-on experience. So the children take a concept, plan the concept, execute the concept, and evaluate their project. This is learning that they'll remember for the rest of their lives when they do this. You may go to school and learn something in sixth grade history, but you won't remember that. But you will remember your 4-H project. And that 4-H project is built on the principles of the 4-H's. You guys know what the 4-H's are? Well, they're head, heart, hands, and health. Head for clear thinking, heart for loyalty, hands for service, and health for better living. These are principles that we can all live by and remember as we age. So without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Kelsey Marcus Sterrett, who is the 4-H program representative for the uh, taking Rosemary Giannini's place, who is at a livestock fair and judge conference. So without further ado, Kelsey. Thank you, Kevin. So um, to clarify, I was the staff for um, Calaveras and Tuolumne County, and I've just recently stepped down, and so Rosemary Giannini will be taking over my position at this time. And um, she is at a conference, so I have decided to come in and help put our wonderful kids in this presentation to you guys as the board. We want to start by really just thanking you for all of your continuous support. As Kevin said, 4-H teaches life skills that have our kids lead for a lifetime. So it's things that will help them throughout their entire lives to become the future leaders of our county, of our state, of our country, of our world. They are amazing kids. I was a 4-H alumni here from Calaveras County, and the things that I learned in 4-H is what brought me to be able to come back to the county and serve here where I grew up and learned so much. 
So uh, we want to really thank you for all things that we've done. Some of our kids who are here today will introduce themselves and share some of their projects. But I want to let you know some of the things that are happening countywide that our members have done over this last year. They have been amazing in their individual projects that they do. They do the animal projects. Some of those might go to the fair and either show as breeding projects or in the livestock auction. But we also have projects in industrial arts. And those industrial arts can also be shown at the fair. And they do have an auction there as well. And so I encourage you to come on Friday of fair, not just on the Sunday of fair, to bid on these items that are amazing welding projects, woodworking projects, things that the kids have put their heart and souls into. But 4-H is more than just culminating their projects and exhibiting them at the fair. They have projects that happen all year round. They do continuous fundraising and learning experiences. The kids will share you with some of you um, their fundraiser that's happening up in Mountain Ranch at, in the middle of next month. In addition, we have countywide events. One of our upcoming countywide events is something we call Home, Home Arts Expo. And this is an event that's open to the public as well. And so it's a public event to, on Earth Day this year, so April 22nd, at uh, Mark Twain Elementary School. And that will be a day where the kids get to exhibit projects that they have done in the industrial arts, but also share those projects and share that knowledge with kids from the community. So it's hands-on experiential learning throughout the entire day focusing on science, um, the arts and crafts, the, uh, we have jewelry making, we have service learning projects that are happening throughout the day as well. And it's a great event and a great day that if you guys want to come and see some of the projects that the kids are doing, it's a great day that kind of ex exhumerates a lot of what happens in 4-H. Uh, we also have kids who are doing a lot of leadership pieces. We have a great summer camp that's happening that Calaveras and Tuolumne put together together and this is going to be our third year of summer camp and over the last two years we have doubled in size in that summer camp and that summer camp has allowed for any kids in the counties and even outside the county we had a kid who came down from Alaska last year who was visiting his grandmother mother and so he came to our summer camp and got to meet kids in California and share his experiences from Alaska and that was a really amazing experience. Those camp counselors, the junior counselors are 14 to 19 year old teenagers who put on the camp and they're actually going to be going to a statewide camping conference this year in a couple of weeks to be able to learn better how to put on a summer camp experience. We also had three members attend a regional leadership conference up in Nevada City over the winter, and that was something that they got to learn from other kids their age across the counties that what they do in their projects and how to better lead. So those are just a few of the pieces that 4-H is doing here at home to be able to bring those life skills that are going to lead them for a lifetime. So with that, and without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to some of our amazing 4-H members. And I'll probably have them come stand over here, and I'll move the mic over that you guys can see them. So, all right, guys, come on up. And if the egg sinks to the bot if the egg sinks to the bottom, it's fresh. If it's if it floats to the top, it's no longer fresh. Well, that's good to know. And what are you gonna be doing with the bonus egg? I'm showing my show bird and I'm selling meat birds. My be my meat birds are Cornish cross. I'm auctioning off a plant holder that says home on it with a heart and that I made in woodworking. Anything else? And I would like to share the 4-H pledge. I pledge my head, I pledge my head to clear thinking, my heart to greater loyalty, 
my hands to larger service, and my health to better living for my club, my community, my country, and my world. Good job. Thank Good you. job. And I would also like to invite you to our chili cook-off at Mountain Ranch. My name is Brent Andolph, and I'm and I wanted to show my bird. Red Old English Game Bantam. Rocco. Yeah. Um. Two years. Brent displaying the wings. This is what he'll have to do at fair as well when he's showing. So showing some of the skills that he's learned that he will be showing. Oh. Nice. Very well done. All right. And then we also, can you guys help pass out some of these? Can you help me pass these out? And then we also have some of our kids who weren't able to come. They drew you guys pictures and thank you cards for all the support that you guys give us. You're welcome. So again, we just really like to thank all the support that you guys give. These kids have done an amazing job and it's always so impressive what they can do because even though I was in 4-H when I was their age, I wouldn't have been able to come and talk with you guys until I was in high school. And so we appreciate everything that you guys have done to help our kids to be able to learn all these life skills that, that they can help with that will help not only themselves but our entire communities as they grow up and they become leadership roles in themselves. I, I do have a question. Yes. What age range are these youngsters? Guys, how old are you guys? She was nine. She said, she said her age. Yeah, she was nine. She's nine. Brant is, how old are you, Brant? Seven. 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 Right. And th their little sister is four, so she will be starting in 4-H next year. So you can start in 4-H at five. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions or questions for the kids? Thank you. Great presentations. Very nice. We'll Good give you guys all of them. Give it to the clerk. <laughs> All right, great presentation, thank you. All right, Madam Clerk, item number three. Item number three is from the library to proclaim the week of April 8th through 14th, 2018 as National Library Week <coughs> in Calaveras County. Supervisor Mills. Yes, I have the honor of uh, reading the proclamation as to proclaim the week of April 8th through April 14th, 2018 as National Library Week in Calaveras County. Whereas libraries are not just about what they have for people, but what they do and with people whereas libraries have long served as trusted and treasured institutions and library workers and librarians fuel efforts to better their communities and schools, whereas librarians, library staff, and volunteers are leaders in their institutions and organizations in their communities in the nation and in the world, whereas librarians continue to lead the way to level the playing field for all who seek information and access technologies, whereas libraries and librarians look beyond their traditional roles and provide transformative opportunities for education, empowerment, and engagement, as well 
new services that connect closely with patrons' needs, whereas libraries and librarians lead their communities in, an, in innovation, enhancing STEAM learning with programs and materials, adult literacy services, educational and recreational programs for all ages, and access and training for new technologies, whereas libraries are pioneers supporting democracy and affect social change with a commitment to providing equitable access to information for all library users, regardless of race, ethnicity, creed, ability, sexual orientation, gender identity, or socioeconomic status, whereas libraries lead in working with diverse communities to offer services and educational resources that transform communities, open minds, and promote inclusion and diversity, whereas libraries, librarians, library workers, and supporters across America are celebrating National Library Week. And Chair, I'm asking for a uh, motion and public comment. I will move this item. I would second it. Do we want public comment? We should have public comment. Any public comment on this item? Good morning, gentlemen and ladies. Nancy Giddens, Calaveras County Librarian. I thank you very much for the opportunity and honor to serve as the librarian of this county. Um, since I came to this job two years ago, the support of the community, county government, and the Board of uh, Supervisors has been so inspiring that it strives us to continue to seek ways to meet the information needs of this county. And they make my job lots and lots of fun. We're working hard to continuously seek new ways to improve our service to everyone. Over 100 volunteers, some of whom are here today, um, help us each week to support our efforts to serve the community alongside our staff in the Central Library and in our seven branches. When we need help, my experience has been all county departments give gracious and generous support, advice, and assistance as we work from day to day. And finally, the Board of Supervisors shows its support <clears throat> by approving our plans for improvement and by continuing to value the library as an institution of value in our county. The theme for National Library this week this year is Libraries Transform. As we celebrate libraries April 8th through 14th, I join with staff to commit to this theme as we help our citizens access information and service for a happier life in a changing world. We will help bridge the technology gaps. We will help them find the information and materials by all means possible and help our children and our youth prepare for happy and prosperous lives in a fast-paced world. It's our pleasure to serve you. Thank you for the opportunity and the support that you give to keep our libraries vibrant hubs in every community in Calaveras County. Any other public comment? All right, seeing none, bring it back to the board. I have a motion by Supervisor Mills, second by Supervisor Clapp. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Pass is 401. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Calaveras County Board of Supervisors <coughs> proclaim National Library Week April 8th through 14th, 2018. All residents are invited to visit the library this week, explore what's new at your library, and engage with your librarian because you and our library leaders, libraries transform. Um, Nancy, could you come up and possibly bring the rest of your um, group up? We can have a... I need to make a, a correction. It was my motion, and not supervisor. No. Yeah, I was going to do that later. Go. 
All right, Madam Clerk, moving on to item number four. Item four is also from the library to proclaim the naming of the San Andreas branch of the Calaveras County Library as the Hubbard E. Tuttle Library. Supervisor Oliveira, I believe you have this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a proclamation and naming of the Calaveras County Library building. Whereas many people in Calaveras County worked hard to help our county build a beautiful central library in San Andreas. And whereas the work of Sally Tuttle is especially notable in that she raised matching funds from community members to entitle our county to a grant from the California State Library. And whereas the work of Shirley Hubbardy is especially notable in her efforts to design, install, and maintain the lovely landscape which surrounds the library building and whereas. The Library Commission and the Calaveras County Friends of the Library want to honor these two women for their extraordinary service to our county library by naming the library building the Hubbardy Tuttle Building and whereas. The Calaveras County Friends of the Library has offered to pay for the lettering which will be affixed to the building and Whereas, this donation has been fully received by the county. I'll open up for public comments. Public comments on this item. It's impossible to name all the people <clears throat> who over the years helped make our beautiful central library the showcase that it is today. And it is a showcase. When people come from other counties to our library, they are astounded and always comment on how lovely it is. Even though many people have been involved in the creation of this building and its beauty, the Library Commission and the Calaveras County Friends of the Library want to honor two women in our county who did extraordinary work to build and beautify our library. Sally Tuttle, as you heard, worked tirelessly to find donors who would give money to match money that was available from the state of California. <clears throat> she succeeded and we were able to build our current building completed in 1995, still beautiful today. Shirley Hubbardy put on her rubber boots and got to work with the landscaping, planning, executing, and maintaining our lovely grounds complete with a picnic area for all to enjoy. I'm very honored to have known Sally briefly after coming to serve as county librarian in April of 2016. She showed up at my door on my first day of work with a card which said, welcome to our library family. She was my first official welcomer. She remained a staunch supporter of the library and served on the library commission until she passed away in November of 2016. Shirley Hubbardy has served as the treasurer of the Calaveras County Friends of the Library since I came and long before that. The beautiful landscaping in our, uh, at our library would not be what it is today without her physical labor, her planning, and her love. Shirley has been instrumental also in acquiring <laughs> donations for the Friends of the Library from the Nielsen Estate, which will en enable us to go on and receive help from the Friends for many years to come. It's fitting that the Commission and the Friends want to honor these two great ladies by naming our building after them. Their, con their great contributions should be and will be remembered. Thank you. Any other public comment? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for a motion. I move the item. I'll second. I have a motion by Supervisor Clapp, second by Supervisor Miller. 
Call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 4-0-1. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed on this day, <laughs> March 27, 2018, the Calaveras County Board of Supervisors proclaim that the Calaveras County Library Building be named the Hubbardy Tuttle Building. Shirley. Shirley, come on up. Madam Clerk, item number five. Item number five is from Public Health Services to proclaim the week of April 2nd, 2018 through April 8th, 2018 as Public Health Week, recognizing the fundamental role that state and local health departments, schools, community-based organizations, and healthcare providers play in carrying out essential public services in Calaveras County. I have it. Thank you. <laughs> That's quite all right. Thank you. Um, so, proclamation declaring the week of April 2nd, 2018 to April 8th, 2018 as Public Health Week, recognizing the fundamental role that state and local health departments, schools, community based organizations, and healthcare providers play in carrying out essential public health division in Cal uh, Calaveras County. Whereas the Public Health and Human Services Agency, Public Health Division, PhD works to protect the health of Calaveras residents, and whereas the provision of public health services improves the health and well being of Calaveras residences, and whereas PhD, in partnership with other departments, works to prevent epidemics and the spread of disease, protect against environmental hazards, prevent injuries, and promote healthy behaviors, ensure food and water safety, respond to disasters, and assist communities' recovery and assure the quality and accessibility of healthcare services, and whereas Public Health Week also recognizes the schools, community-based organizations, and healthcare providers that work together to plan and carry out essential public services, health, public health services. So, public comments. Good morning, I'm Dr. Dean Kaleda. I'm a local family practice doctor for 22 years, and I've been the health officer for Calaveras County since the year 2000. During the first week of April each year, the Calaveras County Public Health Services Agency brings together communities across Calaveras County to observe Public Health Week as a time to recognize the contributions of public health and highlight issues that are important to improving the health of our community. I'm a private practice physician, and when I see a doctor in my office, we have a one-on-one -on -one relationship. But as the local health officer and as our public health department, the community is our patient. And so that's a much different focus. The focus is on the population's health. 
Uh, in many ways, Calaveras County is a healthy place to live. We have low rates of heart disease. Uh, we have low rates of most cancers. Uh, we have low rates of complications from diabetes. We have low amounts of pollution and violent crime. But in many ways, Calaveras County is sick. We have high rates of motor vehicle fatalities, smoking, obesity, chronic diseases, substance abuse, and rural isolation. If the county were a patient, I'd put it in the hospital. <laughs> in the trenches of this battle to good. preserve the health of our community is your local health department. The, ho the local health department focuses on preventing the spread of communicable diseases. We offer vaccinations, tuberculosis testing, and other preventative services. We have a car seat program where young mothers are taught how to you know, safely strap their infant to a car seat and even free car seats can be provided. We oversee programs that protect the most vulnerable members of our society, such as low income mothers and their babies, persons with HIV and AIDS. We coordinate to ensure access to the medical care of our residents by working with the medical community closely, doctors, healthcare organizations, to ensure access to care for all of our residents despite their insurance coverage and their income. We work with emergency response partners to ensure the medical health needs of our residents are met during a man-made or natural disaster, and the Butte Fire was a good example of that. We work with the Environmental Health Agency to protect the community against food and waterborne diseases. We have programs to reduce smoking and chronic disease self-management programs. And those are where individuals who have certain health problems, diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, can learn how to do things to better take care of themselves and reduce their risk of problems from that. So your public health department is staffed with a physician, myself, nurses, uh, those with master's degrees in public health, health educators, community health workers, and all the support staff, all with a singular mission to reduce the burden of disease and improve the health of our community. And sometimes that's not really understood, the assets that you have here, the technical expertise that we have in the health department is, is, is very high. Uh, and I, li I like to say that some of us will rely on the medical system to keep us healthy some of the time, but all of us rely on the public health system to keep us healthy all of the time. And so we have several of the health department and um, public health services staff here today, and so I'd like to have them recognized as well. Maybe they could even stand up if they don't mind. And this is a, a group, again, with a lot of expertise and the singular focus of keeping this community healthy and promoting the health of our, of our community. Um, we invite you to um, an open house, the community and, and our elected representatives, to an uh, open house at the Public Health Department, which is going to be held on Wednesday, April 4th, this Wednesday, from 2 to 4 p.m. And... Um, We'd like, to, we'd like to see you there and tell you more about what the public health department uh, does to keep us safe. When we do a good job, you don't know we're here. It's only when there's problems that it becomes apparent that there's, there's, we're not doing what we need to do. So thank you for your support. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Any public comments on this item? Marty Crane, uh, thank you, Dr. Kaleda, for bringing this up. Um, uh, we talk about being aware of things for this month or this week or this, or, but we should be aware all the time of all of these things. And it's a little overwhelming sometimes, but it's called life. And um, one of the things that uh, uh, I wanted to mention for the library is I'll never forget Sally Tuttle's Dirty Book Club. She did all kinds of wonderful things and did it with fun. It was where they cleaned the donated books, by the way, <laughs> just for those who need to know. But I just wanted to mention that um, one of the things that I'm uh, um, extensively involved with is a collaborative of local agencies. Um, I attend on behalf of the Volunteer Center and Red Cross uh, to a 
monthly collaborative meeting, coalition meeting of agencies all focused on the emergency preparedness aspect um, as it relates to our public health. And uh, under the direction of Diane Verkaman, it is expanded uh, to include all so many voices that we almost have to get a bigger room. But it's, um, it's phenomenal, and I think everybody should know about it and attend if you can. So thank you again, and thank you, Dr. Kaleda. Good morning, Bonnie Newman. Um, with Dr. Kaleda and all the professional health practitioners here, I would like to challenge them to not only recognize April, but also next year perhaps recognize March as National Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. Um, that was a, a challenge I took on a few years ago, and I have to say I was remiss last year in not bringing it up. But colorectal cancer is the second deadliest cancer, only to uh, lung cancer um, for both genders. And um, I would like to see a professional presentation instead of relying upon me, a member of the public who uses gimmicks to come up and get attention to uh, something that um, we should all be aware of. Now, um, I'd like to have four volunteers to share some personal information. <laughs> One, two, three, four. I, I had five, but one he was missing. Um, if you, in an effort to create awareness, if you wouldn't mind telling us, each supervisor, your age and when your last colonoscopy was. This is my comment. We'll start with you, District One, Mr. Toffinelli. How old are you? And uh, Chair, I might remind you this is public comment. Okay. Well, I would probably say you probably do. Um, Mr. Oliveira, would you mind sharing your age and your last experience? Uh, I'm over 50 and two weeks ago. Okay. Congratulations. <laughs> Mr. Mills, would you mind sharing? That's a HEPA issue. Okay. <laughs> then I'd say you're probably overdue. Wrong. How about you, Supervisor Clapp? I have to have another one when I turn 70. Okay. Thank you for sharing. Something people don't like to talk about, but in the past five, six, seven years, colorectal cancer deaths have been on the decrease because public awareness <coughs> has been brought to, into the light and not a nice topic to consider, but this is also a situation where it's do as I say and not as I do because I'm overdue too. So thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Any other public comments? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. Looking for a motion. I so move, Mr. Chair. <laughs> I'll motion second that. Motion by <laughs> Supervisor Oliveira. I think I have fun with that one. <laughs> second by Supervisor Clapp. Call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 401. So be it further proclaimed, the Board of Supervisors recognizes <coughs> the fundamental role the state, local health departments, schools, community based organizations, healthcare <coughs> associates, and healthcare <coughs> providers play in carrying out essential public health services for Calaveras residents. This is passed and adopted by the Board of Supervisors, County of Calaveras, State of California, this 27th of March, 2018. Uh, Dr. Kalita and uh, possibly Ms. Brinks and the rest of the team, if you'd like to come to the front. Come on, the whole team, come on up. Thank you. 
Madam Clerk, item number six. Item number six is from First Five Calaveras. <clears throat> Proclamation declaring April 2018 Child Abuse Prevention Month in Calaveras County. And I have this one. Proclamation declaring April 2018 as Child Abuse Prevention Month in Calaveras County. Whereas children are the future of Calaveras County and deserve our most committed support and protection. And whereas child abuse occurs when people find themselves in stressful situations without community resources and lack the knowledge and skills to effectively cope. And whereas child abuse includes general and severe neglect and physical, sexual, and emotional abuse. Whereas child abuse and neglect increase the likelihood of long-term physical and mental health problems, alcohol and substance abuse, continued family violence and criminal behavior, and whereas research shows that parents and caregivers who seek help in times of trouble are more resilient and better able to provide safety and nurturing for our children. Whereas our community and families are strengthened by social connections, relationships, knowledge, support, and resilience. And whereas as a community, we make children a top priority and take appropriate action to stop the cycle of abuse that destroys the lives of those affected. So, public comment. Good morning, I'm Robin Davis, and I'm with, uh, here with members of PCAC, or Prevent Child Abuse Council of Calaveras. Also with court-appointed special advocates of Calaveras, and our partners, the Resource Connection, UC CalFresh, UC Master Gardeners, and Calaveras Health and Human Services Agency, specifically First Five Calaveras Child Protective Services, and the Calaveras Parent Partners. Of the 619 child abuse reports this year in Calaveras County, 63% were for neglect, where children lack a safe, stable, and attentive environment. Child trauma experts know that this state of chronic fear and stress can alter the structure of a child's developing brain. As adults, when we see signs of troubled children and parents, we work together to encourage supportive and support positive changes before a child is hurt. Uh, you have a flyer and we will be gathering for the second annual Light of Hope and Wear Blue Day on April 11th at 515 in the UC Master Gardeners Demonstration Garden, right across the way here in the Government Center. And we invite you to share this with the community uh, and come out and bring a friend. We have a number of people, if we can have them stand up that have blue uh, pinwheels. We're going to have a display in San Andreas uh, this month, or April. And the pinwheel... Wow. Wow. Good job. The pinwheel... Right. Is, uh, now that's a lot of support. Yeah, and I, these are just the partners for April. I mean, we have schools and businesses, other people that are really doing a lot of work uh, to help families. The pinwheel is a national symbol for the happy and healthy childhood that all children deserve. And we have uh, like to, we have four speakers, and then we'd like to finish our proclamation. No problem. Thank you. Hi. Good morning. My name is Stacy Fleming, and I became a mom at a very young age of 16 to a beautiful baby girl named Jennifer May. My addiction started at 19 when my second child, Michael David, died of sudden infant death syndrome. I would not be here today if I didn't already have my daughter Jennifer to care for. My addiction took me to many places, one of which was a year in jail. During it, I lost parental rights to four of my children. Another was on the last day of July in 2015, I got pulled over with my two youngest children, Mark and Jilly, in the car. I got a DUI. I went to jail. The police took my kids, my dog, and my car. I got my dog back the next day. The car was gone forever, and it took a while to get my kids home from Child Protective Services. Told me that I was bypassable. I didn't even know what that meant. Bypassable means that they did not, they were not required to work with me for the reunification with my children. 
I assured them that given the chance, I would prove that I am the best mother for my children and that I wanted to get better. With their help, I was able to attend substance abuse treatment at Behavioral Health, anger management at Higher Road Counseling Center, and parenting classes. I also went to Celebrate Recovery, NAAA, and with the community support, the support of my social workers, the support of my family, a lot of hard work and God's grace, I was not only able to get my kids home, but we had our case closed early. Now my husband and I volunteer as peer counselors for Calaveras Parent Partners through HHSA. I help other parents who have had their children removed or are involved with CPS through the process. The best person to help someone with an issue is someone who has gone through that journey. If you are in a dark place, there is hope. Calaveras County has a lot of good resources if you know how to find them. How about all of us help each other ignite the light of hope? Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for your service dedication. My name's Mark. That's my wife, Stacy. Uh, I live in Angels Camp with my uh, son, Mark Jr., and my daughter, Jillian. Uh, Mark's 11 and Jillian's 6. I'm a recovering addict and alcoholic also. Uh, I'm a volunteer for Calaveras County, the peer partner parenting mentoring system. What we do is we, when the children are removed, we uh, try to get a hold of the parents and get them focused on their needs and what they need to do, the resources that are available to them, uh, and give them some guidance through uh, personal experience. Uh, we had our children removed, DUI, uh, but due to the support of our community, our, our family, our friends, and our church, we uh, got on the road to recovery. Uh, it was a dark time. It was, it was a horrible, anxious, anxiety-ridden moment. Uh, I'm not an addict by choice or an alcoholic. Uh, we've been clean for a number of years, but uh, addiction pursues whoever it wants. You know, it's not a, 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 a sickness of choice. Uh, like I said, we, when, the, when the children are removed by CPS, we, we intervene, and uh, we work on the strengths of the parents. We don't, we don't work on their, their weaknesses. We try to build them up, their strengths, and we, uh, we try to use the tools, uh, community support, uh, recovery support, and resources available to them to get them back on their feet, get them moving in the right direction. Uh, we, re, we, we focus on the recovery model, not the standard medical model that everybody's boxed into. So we do have a lot of, of you know, examples to work with, a lot more than that's in that paradigm. Uh, we believe everyone has value, you know, and some of us are just in a better position in life to uh, utilize that ideal. Our community, like a chain, is only as strong as its weakest member. Other countries and other counties in the state have utilized this model and it's had great success. To, uh, uh, reunification has gone up 70% above the norm of families and, they, and the continued support of the community has helped the family to recover and get back into society in a healthy mode. Uh, it's similar to a tribal approach, you know, where the, if one person's ill, the whole tribe or community gets around them and focuses on them and tries to work together to help to heal that per individual. Uh, I fought my addiction in a various number of ways. I went to 12-step meetings, uh, uh, counseling, uh, and reprogrammed, but nothing really got into it until I had the, the love around me and the people that supported me and cared about me to help me, to guide me, to, you know, to admonish me and exhort me and set me in the right direction. Uh, I hope it helps understand you a little bit better about what we do, Parent Partners. Uh, it's a, uh, about going on two years program. We've been volunteering. Marina Korakoff, uh, county psychologist, uh, initiated it. And uh, now it's run by Kelly Kirsten, Kerry. And uh, we're hoping that it's going to take off and help. We've already had some success. It's in its infant stages. Uh, it basically boils down to where a person contribute, can contribute and grow with his or her community, where they can find peace and purpose and self and selflessness, and where they can find the light at the end of the hope, end of the tunnel, the light of hope. Thank you for your time and your service. Hello, everyone. My
My name is Indiana. I'm 27 and a father of two young boys. I've lived in Calaveras County for two years now, uh, but before that I lived in Tacoma, Washington with my ex-wife and our children. After three years of being the victim in an abusive relationship, I was able to break away initially, uh, at first with limited visitation with my children, but then came the point where my ex was arrested for DUI and uh, possession of a controlled substance and I gained custody. I knew I had to take that opportunity to move back to California, get divorced, and get a fresh start. Moving was the best choice that I could make for my family at that time, but that was the beginning of a new and difficult challenge. I was not prepared for the onslaught of questions, emotions, and difficult days ahead of explaining how and why to my very young boys, and worse were my feelings of inadequacy and not knowing where I could get help navigating these unknown waters. After some time, my family and I adjusted to the area. I was able to enroll my sons in kindergarten and Head Start, as well as gain employment at our food bank in San Andreas. Despite our lives improving, my sons were still struggling with the reality of their situation. Not long after starting at the Resource Connections Food Bank, I was made aware of the company's vast resources, but more specifically, the Children's Advocacy Center. The center is a federally funded by a grant for free counseling for children who are victims of crime or have been affected by crimes and the negative actions it brings with it. I was apprehensive at first. I thought my sons were too young for counseling, and I was afraid of how I would feel as a parent having to reach out to some organization and some counselor that I didn't know. But my ex-wife's abuses and substance use had caused neglect and trauma on my young boys, and they were suffering. During the spring of last year, my oldest son had an incident at school involving an outburst related to his mom. I was saddened that I couldn't help my son at that moment, and I put my indiscretions aside and made appointments for both of my children. Immediately upon entering the Children's Advocacy Center, I felt a sense of relief. The advocate was friendly. The environment was extremely uh, kid-friendly and amazing with toys everywhere, board games, a, a small trampoline. And Sonny, the counselor there, has an amazing therapy dog in training that my sons instantly fell in love with. I knew I had made the right choice in enrolling my son in the, at the advocacy center. And after the first session, my, my sons were comfortable talking about things with their counselor that they wouldn't share with me. And I was able to get advice about how to handle the delicate situation we were in. A short time later and after some sessions, the positive behavior changes in my sons was evident. I'm grateful for the program helping my sons, but more grateful for it helping me as a parent, naive and terrified, with healthy advice for navigating my family through this sensitive and difficult situation. So please come out and support us at the Light of Hope in April. Thank you. A child can never have too many people in their corner. People who are supportive, encouraging, offering a listening ear. People who are looking out for them. People providing the light of hope to a brighter future. This is even more true of children who have experienced trauma from abuse and neglect. A CASA, a court appointed special advocate, is just one such person who can be the light of hope for these children. A CASA is a volunteer who is trained to help these children understand the complexity of childhood intertwined with the bureaucracy of the dependency system. The system which a child of abuse or neglect must endure while their families are getting the help they need. A CASA is appointed to an individual child to be their mentor, their advocate, and their friend, and an adult role model as they're going through the system. ACASA can be there to help the, them understand, help them communicate. ACASA can advocate on their behalf. The CASA of Calaveras program is new. Last year, we were here presenting, and we were just in the early stages. And since then, seven months ago, we opened our doors, and we are making great strides in being another beacon for the children in this county. We now have recommended to us, referred to us about 16 children and we have 10 advocates. We will always be recruiting volunteers. We need people to step in to work with these children. So I encourage the board and the audience to learn more about how to participate and provide these children a lot of hope in the community. I'm Farrah Roberts. I'm the program coordinator for the Court Appointed Special Advocates Program and a partner in the Light of Hope ceremony. So I hope you guys can come out and participate with us. Thank you. Any other public?
public comments. Good morning again, Marty Crane. I think we should uh, also throw out uh, kudos to our Mark Twain Medical Center because um, when the funding for uh, earlier, uh, when Dr. Kaleda mentioned about the chronic disease self-management, when that funding went away, Mark Twain Medical Center stepped in to fund that. And also with our CASA facility, uh, the facility for the children, Mark Twain Medical Center has stepped in to help uh, make that happen as well. So big kudos to our, our uh, hospital. Um, I wanted to say that um, uh, this, this is really a difficult uh, thing. I served on the um, uh, Child Abuse Prevention um, Commission for years, many years ago, and I remember Robin's first day, and she is, it's, it's remarkable. We all should be very proud of what has happened and what, we, what our community does when they come together. At the Volunteer Center, we say when the community comes together, magic can and often does happen. So um, I, for this subject today, um, we, we've heard how our children can be thrown into uh, um, situations of abuse that they, because they are children, cannot escape without intervention. Um, one thing that we haven't mentioned is um, domestic violence. Another thing that we say, let's, let's all uh, recognize a certain month as Domestic Violence Month. Like I said before, we have to keep all these things in our awareness and on our focus all the time. So in, uh, with respect to domestic violence, I'd like to read something that I brought to you some time ago, uh, but it is very uh, prevalent. Um, lest we forget that our children are uh, subjected many times to uh, child abuse, through domestic violence, um, I quote, the first, he called, first time he called me an effing bitch was on our honeymoon. I found out years later he had kicked his first wife on their honeymoon. A month later, he physically prevented me from leaving the house. Less than two months after that, I filed a protective order with the police because he punched in the glass of our front door while I was locked inside. We bought a house to make up for that one. Just after our one year anniversary, he pulled me naked and dripping from the shower to yell at me. Everyone loved him. People commented, commented all the time how lucky I was. Strangers complimented him to me every time we went out. But in my home, the abuse was insidious. The threats were personal, the terror was real, and yet I stayed. When I tried to get help, I was counseled to consider carefully how what I said might affect his career. And so I kept my mouth shut and I stayed. I was told, yes, he was deeply flawed, but then again, so was I. And so I worked on myself and stayed. If he was a monster all the time, perhaps it could be, have been easier to leave, but he could be kind and sensitive, and so I stayed. He cried and apologized, and so I stayed. He offered to get help and even went to a few counseling sessions and therapy groups, and so I stayed. He belittled my intelligence and destroyed my confidence, and so I stayed. I felt ashamed and trapped, so I stayed. Friends and clergy didn't believe me, so I stayed. I was pregnant, and so I stayed. I lost the pregnancy and became depressed, so I stayed. Abuse is indifferent in education, to an education level, socioeconomic status, race, age, or gender, and no one can ever know the dynamics of another one's relationship. My cycle continued for four more years. Afterward, I let go and welcomed the hard work of healing and forgiveness. My experience made me stronger and able to love more deeply, but my heart breaks for him. In the end, who is the real victim of his choices? As for me, Marty Crane, I cannot help but applaud the strength and wisdom of this woman, Jennifer Willoughby, who fought her way back from a shell of her former self to an unparalleled voice for fairness, respect, and change. As shared by Angela Davis, I am no longer accepting the things I can't, I am no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I am changing the things I cannot accept. Thank you. As a physician, I want to just emphasize the importance of childhood neglect and abuse 
in health problems that people have, not only through adolescence, but adulthood as well. There's a burgeoning scientific field of adverse childhood experiences. And when children have these adverse childhood experiences, it increases their risks of a variety of health problems into adulthood. Not only chronic diseases, substance abuse, mental health problems, a lot of the things that I see every day as a physician in individual patients can all be traced back to these adverse childhood experiences. So the more emphasis that we put on preventing and reducing the incidence of those in young people and in children, especially in the first five years of age, the more it improves the health of our entire community. So this is a very important topic for health and well-being in our community. Thank you. Anyone else? If not, I'll bring it back to the board. Sorry, it's got up slowly. Good morning. My name is George Fry, and I'd like to thank this organization and their director for all they have done for these people. And I'd like to thank the people for being brave enough to come to this podium here and tell their story. I was stationed in uh, West Berlin at Checkpoint Charlie, and I ran an alcohol and drug program for a year there. So I understand their feelings. Thank you. Anyone else? If not, I will bring it back to the board. Looking for a motion. So moved. Move, motion by Supervisor Mills. I have a second? Second, Mr. Chair. Second by Supervisor Oliveira. Call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 4 0 <coughs> 1. Therefore, be it proclaimed that the Board of Supervisors, County of Calaveras, do hereby declare April 2018 as Child Abuse Prevention Month in, Cal in the County of Calaveras. Passed and adopted by the Board of Supervisors of the County of Calaveras, State of California, this 27th day of March 2018. Thank you. Good luck. Sorry. Thanks for waking up. Good luck, too. Thank you. Great speech. Good luck. <coughs> Mr. Chair, I'd suggest that we take a break. It's, it's, ap it's, it's after 10 o'clock. We're going to take a 10-minute break, 15-minute break. All right, we're back in section. Um, Madam Clerk, item number seven. Item seven is from Behavioral Health Services Substance Abuse Program to proclaim the month of April 2018 as Alcohol Awareness Month in Calaveras County, recognizing the role of providing early education about alcoholism and increased support and awareness for individuals and families coping with alcoholism and its effects. And Supervisor Clapp, you have this one. Yes, it's probably appropriate too, since this will be my 39th year of sobriety this month. So, <laughs> in fact, uh, Annie ba uh, Ballantyne, I got his 20 year pin at wow. my house. Um, so anyway, this would be a proclamation 
uh, declaring the month of April 2018 the Alcohol uh, Awareness Month in the County of Calaveras, recognizing the role and providing early education about alcoholism, alcoholism <laughs> and increased support and awareness for individuals and families coping with alcoholism and its effects. We're asked, excessive drinking is responsible for more than 4,300 deaths among underage youths each year. And whereas alcohol is the most commonly used addictive substance in the United States, and whereas more than 1.6 million young people report driving under the influence of alcohol in the past year, and whereas young people <coughs> who begin drinking before age 15 are four times more likely to develop alcohol dependency than those being and those who begin drinking at age 21, and whereas drinking by persons under the age of 21 is linked to 1,890 emergency room visits, and whereas a typical American will see 100,000 beer commercials before he or she turns 18, and whereas kids who drink are more likely to be victims of violent crime to be involved in alcohol-related traffic crashes and to have serious alcohol problems, and whereas a supportive family environment and associated with lower rates of alcohol use for adolescents and whereas kids who have conversations with their parents and learn a lot about the dangers of alcohol and drugs use are 50% less likely to use alcohol and drugs than those who don't have such conversations. All right. So do we have a representative here for this would like to speak? Good morning. Good morning. Mr. Chair, members of the board, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rob Fulgham. I'm with Behavioral Health and I supervise the substance abuse and DUI programs. Last year when I came to the board, I shared that almost half of Calaveras County 11th graders reported using alcohol in the last 30 days. Um, the same data source from 2016 shows that we've had a 10% reduction, which is good news. Yeah, it's good news. Um, also, according to the California Healthy Kids Survey, 48% of ninth graders believe that an occasional drink isn't a big deal. 30% of the clients that come to my services report their first use of alcohol between 12 and 14. Our children continue to abuse alcohol um, and prescription medications. My staff is active in prevention and Friday Night Live. This year we started a youth treatment program where teens are able to meet one-on-one -on -one with a counselor at their school or a place of their choosing. With April just around the corner, I invite you to join with our partners all over the nation to proclaim alcohol or April as Alcohol Awareness Month in Calaveras County. We're asking parents and other adults to abstain from alcoholic beverages for the 72 hour period beginning March 30th and ending April 1st to demonstrate that alcohol isn't necessary to have a good time. Our children learn their beliefs and behaviors from us and what are we teaching them? Like Mr. Clapp said, research shows that kids that talk to their parents about substance abuse may be 50 times, 50% 50 less likely to experiment than kids that don't. If anyone realizes that not using alcohol is different, difficult, we ask they reach out and call 754-6555 for more information on alcoholism. My staff will be available for the entire month of April for no cost alcohol screenings. And as always, we have counselors available Monday through Friday, 8 to 5 p.m. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> Any other member of that group would you speak? Any public comments? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. I'll move the item. A motion by Supervisor Mills. No. Excuse me, by Supervisor Clapp. I'll second it. A second by Supervisor Mills. Call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 401. Therefore, be it proclaimed, the County of Calaveras Board of Supervisors proclaimed the month of April 2018 as Alcohol Awareness Month in the County of Calaveras County. And be it further proclaimed, the Board of Supervisors hereby calls upon all citizens, parents, government agencies, public and private institutions, businesses, hospitals, schools, and colleges in Calaveras County <coughs> to support the efforts that will provide early education about alcoholism and addiction and increase support for individuals and families coping with alcoholism.
Through these efforts, together we can provide hope, help, and healing for those in our community who are facing challenges with alcohol use and abuse. Passed and adopted. Well, we oh, and adopted by the Board of Supervisors of Calaveras County, State of California, this day, 27th day of March, 2018. Do you want to present that to the gentleman? Moving on, Madam Clerk. Public comment. Public comment. Any item of interest to the public that is within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board and is not posted on the consent or regular agendas may be addressed during the public comment period. California law prohibits the board from taking action on any matter which is not posted on the agenda unless it is determined to be an emergency by the Board of Supervisors. If public comment is completed before the 30 minute allotted time period, the board may immediately move to the next order of business. If public comment is not completed during the allotted time period, it will be continued as the last item of business in order to provide an opportunity for the remainder of comments to be heard. All right, this is for public comment for items that are not on our agenda. Benjamin Stopper, District 5. Gentlemen, for those of you who are unable to attend, I would like to share with the board a short summary of the town hall meeting <clears throat> that occurred on March 22nd at Calaveras High School. The meeting was organized in response to recent shoot school shootings across the country and was attended by over 60 people. The panel of speakers included Sheriff Deb Basilio, COSD Superintendent Mark Campbell, Superintendent of Schools Scott Manick, Deputy Director of Behavioral Health, David Sackman, and two students from Calaveras High School. During the Sheriff's presentation, the audience learned that Calaveras County has only one school resource officer for the entire county. That one resource officer is responsible for the security of 17 different school campuses. While the Sheriff expressed his desire to have more school resource officers available, he explained there simply isn't funding for it. As you know, school security has become a national issue since 17 students were killed in a school shooting in Florida. On February 14th, parents, teachers, school administrators, and students alike are concerned about school safety in Calaveras County. And I hope the board takes that into consideration when addressing the budget for law enforcement in the future. Out of this initial meeting, six action groups were formed to continue working on the following areas of school violence prevention. They include school behavior and discipline, work to improve current policies, generate new solutions, infrastructure and security, facility improvements, fencing, surveillance, door upgrades, etc. Interconnectedness, improve communication between all county agencies and community groups, social inclusion, address bullying, reduce social isolation, and improve outreach. Staffing and training, Alice training, counselors, resources for teachers, security officers. See something, say something campaign. Promote the slogan across all campuses, develop systems where kids feel safe, reporting suspicious activities. Over the next few weeks, these groups will meet to develop strategies and bring forth proposals to improve each of these areas. I hope that the county staff and the Board of Supervisors will do everything in their power to assist our local school districts and law enforcement as it struggles to tackle the complicated and incredibly important task of keeping our schools uh, and our students safe. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, something I would also like to bring up that the concerns brought forward with uh, the school shooting in Florida, we sat down and what you see here on what our talks were is how do we address these? So we aren't 
as a group impeding on people's Second Amendment rights, so on and so forth. We're looking at different avenues to addressing these social issues and trying, trying to bring the community together as a whole to address it. And I also um, want to thank you for your time. I'm out of time. Yeah. <laughs> Marty Crane, uh, still and again, um, we, I am so impressed with our children. We've been saying for years in all these meetings, look, there's no one here with color in their hair. What's going on? We need our young people. Well, they thought we weren't listening. And so now they're speaking with uh, one voice. They are looking to bring conversations around who knows what will happen. They're starting with conversations around safety. Everyone should be on board with that. So I am very um, excited. They give me hope. And um, uh, in that same vein, this afternoon you have an agenda item, which I'm not going to speak to, but um, uh, I won't be able to be here. And I see that Supervisor Garamendi is not here, but he is the governing board representative for the uh, mental health board. And um, we have um, the American Legion Post 102 had the good foresight, the lazy auxiliary, to send several wonderful young women, high school students, to Girl State. And one of them is Emily Smith. And you have the good fortune to appoint her to the Mental Health Board today. I will say Mr. it Chair, is- Mr. Chair, point of order. Yes. I do believe that is an agendized item. It is. Right, I just wanted to say that I'm sorry Jack isn't gonna be able to be here. Um, but, and I wanted to say that Mr. we have Chair, many boards and that is an agendized item. Marty, you have to refrain from speaking of an agendized item. Okay, well, go Sorry, forth, Marty. be fabulous, appoint many more. Good morning, board. It's uh, great to be back. I'm sorry that Supervisor Garamendi is unable to join us today. Uh, in the last month, I've been going over the mid-year report that was issued by the county about a month ago. And I'll have to say, it's a remarkable report. And I want to congratulate the board on the budget they put together. And I want to congratulate the board on the way they have administered the budget. For anyone who reads this and actually understands it, this is good news. Unfortunately, we're in an election year. And while people are looking for uh, bumper sticker slogans and hyperbole and everything else, we've had a couple supervisors um, part with the reality of this report and declare that this county is going broke or is broke. That does a tremendous disservice to the people of this county. It does a disservice to the county itself. And it does a disservice to the supervisors or uh, uh, candidates that make that statement. We are not going broke. Uh, many times we're looking for an edge or leverage or something else. I would please ask the supervisors as elected representatives, not as candidates, to please choose their words carefully. Right now, Calaveras County has a double A bond rating. When elected officials and even high appointed officials start making statements that the county is going broke or is broke, that can have an adverse effect on our bond rating. When the bond rating starts to drop, the interest cost for borrowing goes up, and the difficulty in getting loans to operate the county, uh, it becomes more difficult. It's, um, it's dangerous to do that. That's dangerous talk, because it reflects politics and not reality. The reality is in this document. And I would hope that by the end of the year, if you continue to administer this budget the way you have thus far, we're going to have even more good news. And that goes to the board members and CAO LUTs who keep an eye on things and make sure the county is maintaining a sound financial, uh, in found sound financial condition and ready to move forward. There are challenges ahead, but saying that we're broke is not a way to deal with them. So I hope that those candidates uh, and supervisors who have that feeling will put it in a political frame, that they disagree with it, not making statements of fact that have no basis in reality. This county is not broke, and it's not going broke. 
Thank you again for the terrific budget and for what you've done the first six months of this year. Thank you. Nice tie, Al. Thank you. Uh, Al Sagala, Taxpayer Association. I have some uh, some good news, and also, and some other items that are that are, that are more serious. Um, good news is, is uh, we've uh, our board of directors of the Taxpayer Association has approved the uh, nomination of uh, Chief uh, Mike Johnson for our award for excellence in public service for this year. He'll receive his award at our annual barbecue in August. We don't have the date yet. Also, our, our last uh, public access TV program, Taxpayer Alert, featured him and also Corey Burnell, who uh, got into the what's behind uh, um, the uh, protective tariffs. What are the effects of protective tariffs? So. We, in his segment, a 30-minute segment, we have almost a, a lesson in economics, which is very good. The average person needs to understand a little bit more about that. And then, of course, we had uh, Mike Johnson, who talked about uh, his hopes and dreams and where he's been, and, and uh, he's a really a wonderful man. Um, now, on the uh, more serious side, our taxpayer group is... Our taxpayer group has been uh, urging uh, discussion on this issue of, um, of sanctuary counties. And we've put together a, uh, a resolution for that. And we're asking that, uh, that you consider putting this on the, uh, on the agenda for a future meeting or a study session to, to look at that and see what the positive and negative effects of a sanctuary county are. And uh, we've got really wonderful uh, law enforcement in our county and we, we think if you pass a resolution this resolution or something similar that uh, it will be uh, very supportive of having a safe community uh, I don't have enough time to read the whole resolution but I'll read the first part uh, this will also be on our website taxpayer um, calaveras taxpayers dot org a resolution of the Board of Supervisors of the county of Calaveras declaring that Calaveras County complies with federal immigration laws and does not constitute a sanctuary jurisdiction. Whereas the county of Calaveras respects both the rights of members of immigrant communities and the authority of the United States government to regulate immigration and whereas the term sanctuary jurisdiction has historically and correctly been applied to those local governments who deliberately refuse to comply with federal immigration laws and are a result of local policy decisions by that jurisdiction. So elected representatives. Thank you, Al. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, Vicki Reinke, and I am speaking on behalf of the Calaveras Republicans and um, following Al Segala and the um, discussion he had, I wanted to add to that. Um, because sanctuary state has become a huge issue with the public in Ca the state of California. And if you well know, we've come before you before to ask if you would look at putting together some kind of a resolution to oppose sanctuary uh, counties and cities. Um, our state is ignoring the rule of law and the safety and well-being of its citizens. And when um, forcing sanctuary status on all of us in all of the counties and cities. Immigration clearly falls under the U.S. government. It is part of our Constitution. Article 1, Section 8, 4 is to establish a uniform rule to, in that, to naturalization. That's why it's important that we allow our federal government to make those decisions and that we allow people into our country legally and not illegally. And that's the word that nobody wants to talk about is that this is, ta we're talking about illegal immigration. We're not talking about immigration of people who come here the right way. We welcome immigration to our country. So the state of California is defying this law and it is of great concern to the law-abiding citizens we are talking about people 
in the country illegal, um, excuse me, illegally. When we talk about sanctuary cities, we are talking about illegal immigrants, and when they enter our country and commit crimes, they must be deported. And the people look to their local elected officials to stand up and protect all of us, protect the Constitution, and do the right thing for our well-being and safety. So we ask you that you, as local elected officials, look at passing a resolution expressing your opposition to this misguided and dangerous rule that the state has put upon us. Uh, join in with the other counties and cities who oppose it, and we must allow law enforcement to cooperate with the federal government when it comes to criminal illegal aliens. And to take that away from our law enforcement is only going to endanger the public and people in law enforcement. So thank you for considering this, and I hope that you will take action. Thank you. Good morning, board members and staff. I'm Mark Whitehead, Valley Springs. Um, following what Al and, and Vicki had to say, recognizing this, uh, recently Los Alamitos City Council voted four to one to opt out of the California Values Act to do something about illegal immigration, not to cooperate with flawed legislative uh, actions despite legal threats from Attorney General Becerra and Senator Kevin DeLeon, who said that half of his family would be eligible for deportation because anyone who has family members who are undocumented knows that almost entirely everybody has secured some sort of false identification. But before Los Alamitos, the people of Tehama, Shasta, and Siskiyou counties and cities within those jurisdictions went before their governmental officers to discuss this issue, and they succeeded in having resolutions passed. There are more counties and cities in the process of doing the same. So we want you to join them in doing this. The powers of the federal government include promoting the general welfare. We're a country of laws. It's the law to support federal immigration policy, to promote general welfare. Jerry and his friends in Sacramento don't honor the law. They're in violation of at least Title VIII, Section 1324, which deals with bringing in and harboring certain aliens, and they should be held accountable. They took an oath to support and defend against all enemies, foreign and domestic, to bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and the state of California. They've forgotten their oath and are on the wrong side of the law. Please remember your oath. This issue was brought before this board in early 2017 and repeatedly since. You each were sent a similar uh, resolution to what Al has presented to you, and we're still waiting for action on it. The time is now. You don't need another presentation, more hearing from the public. Uh, you don't need more time to chew on this like a tough piece of meat. It's not clear why we have to ask again, because decisions on public safety are part of the supervisor's job, and it should be a priority. Um, we just want this done. We want you to join other counties and cities and pass a resolution for non-sanctuary status. Thank you for your time. Bonnie Newman from Double Springs, or not. Um, I made an interesting observation last weekend. I decided to turn on the children's march that happened all across the nation. And um, I was listening to the children's speeches, um, very uh, emotional, very intuitive, very uh, educational. And as I don't like to pinhole myself into any category. I watch all the news channels. I have a thing that I can go through each news channel. And I noticed that every single channel was broadcasting these children's speeches. I, I, was, I was so emotional. My tears were running down my face. I've never felt such pride. And I think these kids are so far beyond all of us old geezers are that we'll never be able to catch up. And thank God someone else is going to take over because we're going to hell in a handbasket. But what I noticed that 
Every channel had these children speaking except one. And they were interviewing somebody that was disrespecting, that was discrediting, was uh, undermining the very things these children were talking about. <laughs> and I was appalled that they weren't carrying this very important message on their channel. And I don't know how much longer I can watch Fox News, but they were such a disappointment that they were not covering these children's speeches. And I noticed later on in the day on Fox, two uh, news uh, people were talking and they replayed part of it. And one of those newscasters couldn't even speak. She was so overcome with the emotion. And <laughs> it's, why are people trying to suppress what is going to be the future? Why are people trying to undermine what I consider to be the true essence of America, which is people are allowed to be free, to speak what they need, to, to get recognition, and to be valued for what they are. Um, I was very heartened to see these young people stand up. And I, I'll give up my place, and they can take over. And I was so disappointed to see some of the news coverage. Thank you. Any other public comments? OK, so <coughs> none. We'll close public comments. Move on to the consent agenda. Madam Clerk. Consent agenda items are expected to be routine <clears throat> excuse me, and non-controversial. They will be acted upon by the board at one time without discussion. Any board member, staff member, or interested party may request removal of an item from the consent agenda for later discussion. Any board member wish to pull an item from consent? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, number 17. Staff member, any member of the public? I actually had some. Oh, excuse me. Hold on. Yes. Um, I need to poll and move to a, a date undetermined at this point, but in, in April, item number 15, which is an amendment um, for professional services agreement between the county and California Association of Environmental Health Administrators. Tim, you want to set that to what date? I'm saying date unspecified so that oh, okay. um, it's easier for the system if we don't specify a date. I, I would expect probably April 17th. Okay. okay. Members of the public. Yes. 13. What? 13. 13. George, you're also 13? Yes, sir. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Bonnie. Well, Looking for a motion for the remainder of the consent agenda. I'll make that motion. I have a motion by Supervisor Clapp. I'll second. Second by Supervisor Mills. Any further discussion? If not, call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 401. Item number 12, Madam Clerk. Item 12, <clears throat> excuse me. It's from the Sheriff's Department to adopt a resolution to apply for and accept an award from the California Department of Parks and Recreation Division of Boating and Waterways, Boating Safety for funding of the Calaveras County Sheriff's Office Boating Safety Unit for fiscal year 2018-19 in the amount of $174,926. Bonnie, you had a question? Yes. Okay. I was wondering, uh, it says an award. Is this a grant or is it award? And was it a competitive or non-competitive process? 
and what are the funds to be used for? Okay. Good morning, Jim Macedo from the Sheriff's Office. Uh, this uh, is a, uh, a grant award. Uh, it is a competitive process, although the Sheriff's Office has had this uh, grant for uh, at least 24 years. Uh, it is utilized to fund a uh, sheriff's supervisor or sergeant, a boating safety deputy, uh, the boats, equipment, and uh, fuel, and uh, related equipment for boating safety and patrol. Okay. All right. Any other public comments? George Fry, piggybacking on what Bonnie said, is it an award? Or is it a grant, or what is it? It was it's awarded. It was a grant they applied for and were awarded. Okay, thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. Any other public comment? If not, I'll bring it back to the board for a motion. So moved, Mr. Chair. Sorry. I have a discussion item. Okay, Mr. Uh, I'm sorry, Captain Macedo. Could I have you return to the podium? You mentioned this program has been in effect for 24 years, at least. At least. What was the maximum number of deputies assigned to this program in that 24-year period? Uh, we had, um, it, it's really always been two. Uh, there's been some subtle variations. We had some extra higher, uh, extra higher staff that worked it for a while as well to supplement. And we still do supplement it on busy holiday weekends to try and add staffing to some of the busier, uh, busier lakes. I can't, I can't speak uh, with you know, absolute clarity on what happened prior to me working here, but I, I have had conversations with staff where they used to bring in uh, uh, off-duty deputies at a set rate or retired deputies to supplement, uh, uh, you know, the, the various lakes uh, with respect to uh, busy holiday weekends, concerts, uh, those types of things. Okay. Has this program always been funded through this grant? Um, it, Within my time, yes, it has. Okay. Um, I can only, on, only during your time here. Correct, yes. There's, there's some taxation that, that also supplements this uh, as well. Uh, but yes, this is what has funded our uh, boating safety program. Have you ever reduced the number of uh, deputies in this program due to budget cuts? Yes. And when was that? During the uh, recession beginning in 2007, 8. Have you made up those deficits? To a certain extent, yes. And how do you do that? Through county funding? Uh, no, we've reapplied and the award uh, amount went up and I mentioned taxation. Uh, during the recession, that taxation lowered and as uh, the economy recovered, that taxation uh, has risen. So the county really doesn't fund this program. It's funded through the grant program. Is that correct? Uh, correct. The county does incur some subtle costs. Um, with respect with hiring and transfers of employees, administrative overhead type okay. costs, but for the most part, it is, uh, it is funded through this grant. So if you took away that funding revenue, would your budget and the county's budget fulfill those requirements? We would have to request additional funding through, uh, through the county, through either the general fund or some other means. In yeah. order to what do you think the success of that would be, given the information we know now? Well, I would certainly hope the county would fund it. Uh, I know that there's a high demand for services on uh, Lake Tullock, uh, New Hogan Reservoir, uh, Comanche. We have some uh, East Bay Municipal Utilities funding that supplements that. Um, however, there are people who, uh, who are, uh, you know, are involved in boating accidents, drownings throughout the year, and they uh, require, uh, you know, require law enforcement services. We also get a great number of complaints, uh, as I mentioned, uh, from the residents of Tullock Reservoir due to noise and uh, you know, behavior that's disturbing uh, the residents and other, other boaters. Okay. Think the county's in a position to fund that if that draw, if your funding stream is withdrawn from the state? That would certainly be up to a decision of the, the board. I would, again, uh, certainly hope they would because we think it's an important program. Uh, it does provide some safety and, uh, and also some supplemental patrols in areas where there, uh, where there are issues from time to time. And also there's a certain amount of preventative measures that we do to try and avoid drownings. We specifically task uh, staff to get ahead of problems, such as people riding in the back of boats, being uh, traveled, traveling down the roadways, uh, walking along the shoreline, uh, reminding people, and even providing bull uh, 
bulletproof, but uh, okay. uh, life vests. Uh, so we do do some preventative, proactive measures uh, in order to try and get ahead of uh, drownings or, or accidents. So these are one of the programs that we constantly have to be, key, be aware of in case we lose that funding stream through grants. Do you think the county has enough money to do these programs? Supervisor Oliver, I'm not sure what you're driving at, but yes, I, I think the county has the, the means and the wherewithal. They would certainly have to transfer those funds from somewhere else. Uh, but uh, again, that would be up to the five board members to decide. That's not what's before you here today. Uh, today here, uh, we've been, uh, we're asking to apply for and accept the, the award uh, should we receive it. Okay. Thank you, Captain. Appreciate it. You, and without jumping into a separate discussion, but it has to do with marine safety on Lake Tulloch. Uh, it is a unique lake. There's only five like it in the western states uh, for various reasons. But it's also shared with Tuolumne County. And I think that, uh, you know, if we were going to look at marine safety on Lake Tulloch, well, there are a lot of options out there that we haven't explored uh, that we probably will need to look at in the future. So marine safety in general, that is the one lake that we really don't have a lot of direct. You get grants from, for New Maloney's for operations on other lakes as well on top of this, am I correct? Those are separate contracts. Right, uh, for that, that operation. Are not, that are not necessarily, uh, those contracts are not necessarily directed towards uh, on the water patrols. Uh, but uh, as you mentioned, yes, the, that those lakes, we do have more than one lake that uh, go across county borders. We stagger our patrol and work with the other counties to try and ensure we have, you know, maximum amount of uh, presence on those lakes. We also work in a team-like fashion uh, during holiday weekends, but with respect specifically to Calaveras County, um, the one grant that supports over water, directly over water boating safety related patrol is this grant. That's correct. And, and that, I just wanted to bring that up that the majority of our lakes, except for Hogan, are shared with other counties. Uh, whatever we do is going to in, impact them in some way as well. So this has to be an understanding that we're all got to work together here in a larger sphere. Correct. Thank you. Thank you, Captain. Thank you. All right. I had a motion. Was that by yeah, the Yeah, I've item? moved the item. Yes, Supervisor sir. Mills moved this item. I have a second. Second. Second by Supervisor Oliveira. We had public comment. That was that was board asking staff. We already had public comment on this item. Um, call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes four zero. Item number 13, this is pulled by Al. Item number 13 is from the Air Pollution Control District to approve a budget transfer for Carl Moyer contract with Mark Twain Elementary and authorize the auditor controller to adjust the district budget. This requires a four-fifths vote of the board. I have Al, e yeah. this item. Um, I have an easy question. What, what amount of money is involved? It's 165000 Thank you. It's yeah. in the agenda packet. Th that was in the agenda packet. Um, and I'm sorry, I had asked somebody from environmental health to be here, but nobody popped in, so thank you for that. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Any other public comments? George Fry. <clears throat> the um, item 13, my question has to do with the City of Angels. Do they have anything in terms of being involved with the air pollution control district in terms of um, contracts? I'm uh, ad admittedly not an expert in the Carl Moyer, Moyer program, but I can, I can get information on that for you and follow up. Although my understanding of the program, certainly if they had um, if they had infrastructure that was eligible for the program, they could apply through it, and we would um, assist with that, um, with the application process. That's correct. Thank you. That's correct. Any other public comment on this item? If not, I'll bring it back to the board for a motion. So, so moved, Mr. Chair. Moved by Supervisor Oliveira. Second. Second by Supervisor Mills. Call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 4-0-1. Item number 14, 
motion approved by Bonnie. Item 14 is from the administrative office. One, to authorize the purchasing agent to piggyback on the state of California vehicle commodity contracts for the acquisition of vehicles on a countywide basis through the extended term of August 21st, 2018. Two, authorize the purchasing agent to piggyback on new vehicle contracts to be awarded by the state this fiscal year through its initial term and any extended term. Three, Ratify the purchasing agent signature on purchase orders totaling $381,000 for vehicle purchases already made this fiscal year. And four, authorize the purchasing agent to utilize formal or informal bidding procedures for the purchase of any vehicle approved on the county's capital asset list that may not already be covered under a competitively bid contract issued by the state of California. Bonnie, you had a question? Yes, I did. Um, and maybe some of it was answered just by reading it more carefully, but are these vehicles that we are, the county is purchasing or are they leasing them? And is the money coming out of the general fund or has there been uh, different uh, available funds targeted so that money isn't coming out of the general fund? And how is the Car, uh, the countywide carpool do, doing as far as utilizing what uh, uh, vehicles we already have, we already have ownership of. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Bonnie Rich Administration. Um, I think what I heard uh, this Bonnie ask is, um, these are replacement vehicles that are being purchased brand new. They are not leased. We are piggybacking on state of California competitively bid contracts for the acquisition of these vehicles. Attached to the agenda item is a spreadsheet that identifies uh, which ones are general fund, uh, which ones are coming out of general fund and which ones are not coming out of general fund. We currently, as a county, do not operate a fleet pool, if you will. And I know that that is something that the CAO is looking at long term um, and how we can um, uh, best utilize our vehicles. Um, I can tell you that the vehicles that we are replacing, we are replacing with new because the vehicles are end of life. They are no longer safe to drive. We surplus them. When we surplus them at auction, the older vehicles, we do get those funds back. Um, and was there another question, Bonnie? I think we did walk. Oh. Okay. Uh, Bonnie, before you walk away, just, just for clarity here, is for health and human services or vehicles that are purchased with them. There are some of these contracts that we can't transfer that vehicle to some other portion of our our entity. They they have to stay within your the HHS organization or be removed from the system. That is so. absolutely correct, Supervisor Mills. There are, are a few departments such as HHSA where they have specific grant funds or funds made available to them to purchase assets that are to be used strictly for their functional area purpose and absolutely cannot go and should not go into a fleet pool. In other words, they are owned by the department. Thank you. Any other public comments on this item? Okay, we're gonna go with this again. I think on this item, um, I think it's safe to say we don't, we don't have to ask the question and, and hear the answer that if uh, revenue streams dry up and has to come out of the budget, is it gonna make it difficult to accomplish this task? Uh, I don't think so. Um, as we've heard before, the hypothetical um, uh, reduction in revenue streams to create some sort of panic or uh, some, other, s some other emotion with the public uh, is not doing us a service. If the state of California, whether, whatever they're doing with this, that's great. Chances are it's our tax money coming back to us. Um, 
if the state of California cut off funding for bailiffs, we'd have to absorb that. If they didn't send us our sales tax, we'd have to make up for that. There are dragons and demons and everything else down the road that we can dream up that we don't have to deal with right now. The county's in good shape. Items like this tend to pay for themselves. It's our money coming back to us. And it's insulting to hear about the, the hypotheticals that could take place because they haven't taken place and they're not likely to take place. If a program has been in place for a long time, it will probably remain in effect for a long time. So anyway, all these things indicate that the county is on top of it. We're looking at awards and grants and funding to help our county out and to pay for services, all for the benefit of our citizens. And I thank the board for having an open mind, uh, for looking at these things in a logical manner, not an hysterical manner, and uh, securing this funding and the items for, for our county and for the people of our county. Thank you. Any other public comment? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for a motion. Well, Chair, just a point of discussion here since it was brought up. Um, if you look at the approved budget amounts and then the actual purchase order amounts, because we're into a pool, uh, there is a significant savings. That's the First, so, uh, secondly, that there are 22 vehicles in this list and I appreciate the staff putting this list together, but only six of them and a half of a seventh one are actually purchased through general fund. The rest of them are coming from other funding sources to say that, you know, all vehicles are purchased from general fund money or tax money is incorrect uh, in, in property tax revenue. So uh, let's be sure that we understand the, the sources of revenue and revenue streams and where those are specifically to be allocated to. It's an important part of this decision. So I see some substantial budget savings in this whole discussion. And I very much appreciate uh, having to go in this direction. And I hope that as other utility agencies within Calaveras County look at this as a model, maybe they can start applying it into their business models as well. Thank you. Any board comment? Not I'm open for a motion. So moved. But motion by Supervisor Oliveira. I'll second it. Second by Clapp. Any further discussion? If not. Call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Passes 4 0 1. We'll go on to item number 16. Item 16 is from the Administrative Office to adopt a resolution continuing the local state of emergency for the Butte Fire. Um, good morning. I, I just pulled a newspaper article out of the Stockton Record today, and it says, Utilities want customers to help pay wildfire damages. So where's the money coming from to uh, uh, reimburse all the people that have losses? It's coming from all of us customers of PG&E who pay our bills every month. I would imagine that probably the, the administrators and CEOs and all the big shots in uh, PG&E aren't going to suffer any losses. I would imagine that um, probably the wages of the employees aren't going to be lowered. But I have a feeling just from reading this article that the people that are going to end up paying the bill is going to be the people that pay their uh, PG&E bill each and every month. And so, you know, we, we just want to point out sometimes that things aren't always what they seem. I, I was under the impression that PG&E was coming in and making good and they were going to take care of all the, the damage and help the people. And it turns out, I guess I'm going to be helping all the people and all the people that pay their bills at PG&E, we're all going to be helping all the people. And I, I just want to show my dis discontent in how things filter out at the end. Thank you. Any other public comments? If not, I'll bring it back to the board for a motion. I'll move it. Uh, motion by Supervisor Clapp. Second. Second by Supervisor Mills. Call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 4-0-1. Moving on to item number 17, Madam Clerk. 
Item 17 is also from the administrative office to adopt a resolution continuing a local state of emergency for the winter storm damage from extreme weather events that began on January 7, 2017 through the month of February 2017. Supervisor Mills, you pulled this item? Yes, so uh, we have been in a continual state of uh, redoing this local state of emergency where the board has never had an opportunity to review the status of these projects as a whole. And I know that, for instance, item 24 is one of those projects and we've had the White Pine Bridge, but we've never really talked about all of those items that are listed here. I have two in, in uh, District 4. Um, it certainly would be interesting to know what are our plans here uh, with each one of those items and what is the timelines to where we could accomplish those goals. Good morning, Michelle. Good morning, board. How are you? Michelle Patterson, OES Director for Calaveras County. Um, so I'm really actually glad that you are bringing this up because for the past five or six weeks or so, I've basically been doing what I'm terming forensic emergency management and trying to pull all of those pieces together so that we do understand what the big picture status is of all of the projects, not limited to the winter storms, but inclusive of the Butte fire um, recovery efforts. So um, perhaps we can come back and schedule a presentation um, for, an, for a future meeting um, and I'd be happy to give kind of an overall presentation. I've been working really closely with Cal OES and FEMA trying to um, tidy up some paperwork um, and get some of the things moving that had been stuck there for quite a long time. I see that as the ultimate goal is, is I just think that the board needs to be more thoroughly appraised on the status of the various projects. Um, we're going month over month over month of these continual declarations. I think we, we as a board deserve to know what's the progress, where are we at? Absolutely. How can we help you if we need to? Absolutely. So yeah. thank you. That's the only reason I pulled the item. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Any public comments on this item? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board. Supervisor Mills, would you like to? Well, I'd make the motion to approve. I have a motion by Supervisor Mills. I have a second. Second, Mr. Chair. Second by Supervisor Oliveira. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 4 0 1. All right. Do they want to take a break so we can? No, we're going to move on. Yeah. Set up. You need, you need, oh, you need, that's what I was asking. You need a break. It would take a five minute break. We are back in session. Madam Clerk. Item 20. Item 20 is from the administrative office to receive a presentation from the 2017 Leadership Calaveras class highlighting their current project to provide comfort bags to the homeless in the community. Mary Beth, you're up. Good morning, supervisors. Thank you for having us here this morning. Uh, Mary Beth Hospital, I'm a part of the 2017 Leadership Program. I'm happy to be here this morning along with a few others that are in our group. Those of you would stand. Got a couple back here, us, and right here. Stacy right. could not be here this morning. Um, she is at home with the flu, so um, I hope you're feeling better, Stacy. Uh, Leadership Calaveras is a 10-month program designed to encourage the development of community leaders identify local issues and needs, and explore solutions. This program has provided us with educational experiences to increase awareness and knowledge of vital organizations in Calaveras County. Our class participants include Allison Wright, Above and Beyond Travel Agent, Andrea Tickwit, CCOE, Bradley Jones, Deputy District Attorney, Casey Vacareza, Cal Waste, Dave Egerton, CCWD, Jessica Johnston, Angels Camp Business Association, John L. Whitehouse, Signal Service, Catherine Eustis, CCOE, Lorna Bache, East Bay Med, Mary Beth Hospital, Cal Waste, Patrick Garahan, Calaveras Unified School District, Tim Hildebrand, CalNet, Tim Johnson, San Andreas Memorial Chapel, Tom Pratt, Face Insurance Services, Tony Ann Fisher, 39th DAA Calaveras County Fairgrounds. 
So far, we have had the opportunity to learn about our local government and law enforcement, visit the state capitol and the California Office of Emergency Services, an in-depth history tour of Calaveras County, natural resources with a tour of SPI's mill and a working logging site, a visit to McCalmy Hill Fish Hatchery in Comanche, party reservoirs, and an inside look at the party dam. We were able to prepare meals for the Meals on Wheels program and serve meals to seniors through Common Ground Senior Services. Learned about the operation of the 39th DAA Calaveras County Fairgrounds and an extensive look at the services provided by the County Office of Education. We took a tour of the Cal Waste Transfer Station and their world headquarters in Galt and finished up our monthly sessions with a tour of Ironstone Vineyards and Mangini Ranch last week. Each year, the leadership team takes on a project that we feel will be beneficial to Calaveras County. We are excited to introduce to you today our project, We've Got Your Back. Now I will turn it over to Jessica. Thanks, Mary Beth. Uh, leadership 2017 has recognized a need for members of our community, from young children to the elderly, who um, are in distress situations and the need to have access to essential items to help ensure their physical and emotional well-being. Whether it be a victim of a random crime, domestic violence, someone who just needs a hand up or is homeless, we feel that our project is a unique resource that can assist a variety of community members. Our goal is to raise $5,000 to purchase the items needed for the comfort kits. And once the funds are collected, our team will put the um, kits together and um, we hope to do at least 250 bags. So these kits will be tailored to fit the needs of men, women, and children, and will include things like personal hygiene items, a warm blanket or clothing, snacks, coloring books, and journals. These are things that we call comfort kits, um, but some will also be geared for the homeless and people who may be living on the streets. So along with personal hygiene items and snacks, those bags will also include survival type items, such as a small tarp, hand warmers, and first aid supplies. So we have partnered with the uh, Calaveras District Attorney's Victim Services, who serves over 100 new clients per quarter, and the Resource Connection Calaveras Crisis Center, who served uh, 900 men, women, and children in 2017. We've also partnered with the Angels Camp Police Department and the Calaveras County Sheriff's Department. They will have the comfort bags in their patrol cars. Um, that are suited for our homeless population. And in 2015, the number of non-traditional homeless was estimated at more than 500. Those are your couch surfers. And in the county, um, that's in addition to the estimated 165 traditional homeless. So we hope that this project doesn't end with us. We hope that a local organization can adopt it and continue to grow so that they can be available in the future. Um, so we are seeking donations, financial contributions that would allow us to purchase the items needed for the kits. We are currently working with local retailers and organizations um, to get wholesale costs. And monetary donations will help us put these bags together and um, benefit many people in our community. So we want to um, kind of give you an update of what we're what we've accomplished so far, we've raised $3,252. You can see our major supporters and our friends and advocates. Um, we would like to thank Dignity Health Mark Twain Medical Center for sponsoring the drawstring backpacks. I think there's a sample up there. Mary Beth has one. Um, and everyone who has contributed to the project and those who are helping us spread the word. We thank you in advance for your support and the opportunity to present to you today. And now I'll turn it over to Bradley Jones. What's uh, so great about the leadership program is each year when it forms, part of the task is to look at a need in our community or an issue that can be addressed by the Chamber of Commerce uh, leadership program. And this year's program is uh, especially meaningful to me as a prosecutor in this county that so much of what law enforcement deals with on a daily basis for our frontline responders are the tough times, the, the rougher parts of the human experience. And when our community comes together uh, through our small businesses, our government organizations, our, our government employees, and puts together these kits and arms our first line responders with these, 
I don't know, I was going to probably use, say, you know, these weapons of kindness, but, but um, these, these abilities to just on the spot show caring and, and, and pay it forward, and it, so to speak, just builds the pillars of our community, makes them stronger, add new, adds new ones. Uh, when our young people, children, just giving them a coloring book for the endless waiting periods that sometimes accompany interactions with our government, whether it be fire, police, um, our, our other services, child protective services, and just be having them able to color while that process is going on just shows a, a side of humanity just as a toothbrush and toothpaste can do. And that's what we've come together as a leadership group and done. And um, while, while I've been part of it and being helpful, um, I, I also am very thankful that we live and work in this community. And I think that's what I was adding. So. so we have a couple pamphlets up here. If anyone is interested and wants to make a donation, there was a slide that checks are to be made payable to the Calaveras Chamber of Commerce. They are holding the money for us. And um, we do have a deadline of April 16th. Donations can still come in, but we would like to have the donations by the 16th so that we can make up the bags, distribute the bags to um, the DA's office, uh, the uh, crisis center, and then get those to law enforcement. So thank you guys for letting us present today. We are so excited about this project. And if you have not done leadership, I encourage you to sign up to do leadership. It is a great program. So thank you. Uh, I have a question. Yes. <laughs> Hope I can answer it. What, what does... What does each one of these kits cost you to put together? Okay, uh, good question. So, uh, maybe Jessica, you can hold. Yeah, we I'll hold them up. So we estimate about 10 to $15 per bag. Um, this is a sample homeless kit. It'll be in the backpack. It will also include things like socks and a warm beanie, the tarp. Um, so these are a little less than the other bags that we are, the comfort bags for the men, women, and children. Those are a little more expensive because we are including um, some blankets or some clothing in some of them, like some pajamas for kids. So if they're displaced and they need to go to the crisis center or somewhere, this is got a toothbrush, it's got a pajamas. No, yeah. I'm saying, yeah, here you Yes, yeah. everything is here. There's, um, you know, the items that Brad talked about, the coloring books, some bubbles, something to just make that, that experience a little less traumatizing, give them something to do at that time. Um, this is for a, a female woman. It's a female item. So, you know, there's a toothbrush, first aid kit, a hairbrush, a blanket, um, some snacks, and some tissues. You know, just some essential items that we take for granted, you know, every day we have those as well. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. That's no, correct. Go, go ahead. No. Yeah. Folks, do we know uh, our best current population numbers for homeless in Calaveras County? Um, we don't have the most up-to-date numbers, but we are working with um, Health and Human Services to get those. Do we know what that number is and what you're working off of? And this is only with a $5,000 funding stream? Can you can you turn your mic, Catherine? Can you turn your microphone on and, and okay. Pat pull that one over? And if you're going to speak, then turn it on. Sorry. That way, the television audience and there people we go. out we, here can hear. Go ahead, Catherine. As you may know, the homeless census is the the efficacy of the homeless census is a function of the number of people who are able to get out and actually do the counting and whether or not those are people who know where people are and people who will, people will reveal themselves to. So a couple of years ago, it was really accurate because there was a lot of effort put into putting the right team together to do that particular census. And since then, we haven't been able to get that team together as a county. So that would be a great way to find out what the actual population is to really put energy into getting the right homeless census team together. And there's actually a group of people working on that as citizens and community members right now. So I would imagine within the next year, we'll have a pretty accurate count. So basically, we're dealing with information that's two years young or two years old? Correct. I would say, okay. yeah. And that's 165, you said, Mr. Garahan? Lights, this lights not on. Right here in the program, it's uh, estimated it, as of 2015, so a couple years back, uh, number of non-traditional homeless was estimated at more than uh, 500, and in addition to the estimated 165 traditional homeless. 
Okay, thank you. Can, can you say that again so she can get that on? <laughs> on can you repeat it? Uh, it didn't go out on the television. She didn't get it. That's why she came with <coughs> the mic on. You just turned it off. Again. When the red light's on, there you go. So, yeah, yeah, so they can, she can get it on. Okay, 2015 uh, estimates the number of non traditional homeless was estimated at more than 500 within the county in addition to the estimated 165 traditional homeless. Okay. The non-traditional being the couch surfer type folks that bounce from house to house. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Is that it? No. Super, Supervisor Mills? Yes, I would be very curious to know what that average age is. I know what it is in Tuolumne County and I know they've had a recent survey done there. So their average age is nine. I concerned about what it is in our county and whether we really have a good understanding of the number of young folks that are literally out of the system. In other words, we're not even aware that they're out there but because they're moving from home to home and just quietly moving throughout the system. Uh, secondly, you, you touched on some numbers. Uh, victim services, 400 per year. Uh, you had two other numbers there and I was trying to write them down. Yeah, so we have uh, victim services. They serve over 100 new clients per quarter. So yes, over 400 new uh, clients per year, in addition to those that are, you know, that they've already worked with. And then the um, Calaveras Crisis Center, their number was 900 men, women, and children for 2017. That's a big number. Yeah. When you think of a percentage of our total population. So, maybe a new project. Yeah, we'll need more money. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good point. Do we have any public comments on this item? Oh. Yeah. Sorry, Vicki Reinke. I just have a question. Um, because of time constraints, are you not able to take like donations of items versus money? Is that why you're asking for the money? So the reason we are taking monetary donations is because um, when the Butte fire was going on and we were asking for donations, people were just bringing in droves of things and bless their hearts, sometimes the stuff that comes in is stuff that we can't reuse again. So the donations are to keep it within um, what we actually need for these bags and to keep it um, them, them consistent, the bags consistent. The crisis center and the victims advocate unit where these will be housed, they only have room for like 25 bags at a time. So the um, CBRC, did I say that right? The CBRC will be holding on to this, uh, the, the um, surplus of bags until we can start getting rid of them. So I hope that answers your question. Susan. Susan Morris, Angels Camp. And I think somebody went through it quickly, but could they answer the question, what's the difference between traditional and non-traditional homeless people? Because I think that um, probably has some significance. So it's our understanding that the difference between traditional and non-traditional homeless is um, your traditional homeless are those who you may see out on the streets who um, are living out on the streets and don't have shelter. And your non-traditional homeless are those who maybe are couch surfing, they're young or they're older families, they're, um, they don't have a permanent residence of their own. Thank you. Any other public comments? Uh, Al Sagala, Taxpayer Association. This is really wonderful work that the Chamber's doing. Um, Sometimes uh, we discover that uh, the body follows the mind. You, quite often when you find people that are in pretty rough straits, um, they feel they're a victim. They don't feel that they're in charge of their own, their, their own life. And so with that attitude, they pretty much get what they expect to be a victim. But over the last uh, 50 years, there's been quite a bit of 
uh, work done on human motivation. This is where uh, not just Zig Ziglar, but a lot of other people have put together uh, inspiring information that can allow people who may want to, to really change their concept of whether they're accountable for their own lives or not. And when people are uh, accountable and feel they're accountable for their own lives, they, they move upward because that's what they expect. So perhaps something can be put in these packets that might be appropriate for the age level that would be inspiring and, and prevent them from going back down to where they were. Just an idea. Thank you. Any other public comments? Good morning again, George Fry. Uh, this picture where it shows uh, 2017 leadership Calaveras helping to make a better Calaveras. One of the persons that's in the picture is Tom Pratt. So I hope it's okay for me to make a public service announcement. He uh, is running for the uh, state of California Senate. He is the only rural candidate. It's not about blue or red yeah you can't really make a, a political statement here George. okay okay all right she's so yeah. step out in the hall and i'll tell you all about him okay. <laughs> <laughs> because we need him in the senate the other two candidates are from fresno <laughs> all right any other public comments all right seeing none we'll there's, it's not a non-action item, so we'll move on to the next item. I, I will say this, though. We, we will break for lunch at 12 o'clock, and we will go until 1.30. So from 12 to 1.30, we will be at lunch. Okay? And I want to thank the leadership program, everybody that came here today. Um, great presentation. Carry on. Thank you. I, I was part of the leadership program in 2009. Um, I dropped out with a couple of things to go because the time frame I was part of committees at that time and when they were meeting the committees met so I had some opportunities to go to some of the things that we've done at the leadership but not all of them so I didn't graduate but it was a great program so you. welcome again. All right, moving on. Item number 21. Um, I just was going to add on, on this next item before the clerk mentions it. We, we estimated approximately an hour for this item. We have um, representatives from PARS here. Um, so they, Krista will do a brief introduction, then they will do a presentation and then open it up to discussion. Um, I don't know if um, the chair would like to start that and then stop or how you would well, like to. Well, let, let's see where we're at when we get to 12 o'clock. Okay. okay, we'll see and we'll go from there. How much? Yeah. Go faster. <laughs> Item 21 is from the administrative office to adopt a resolution approving the adoption of the public agency's <coughs> post employment benefits section 115 irrevocable trust administered by Public Agency Retirement Services. Oh, there you go, we got it. <laughs> Good morning, um, Good morning. board chair, uh, members of the board, Christopher Mata administration. Uh, here to speak with you today about um, our recommendation to adopt the Section 115 Irrevocable Trust administered by PARS. Um, just, uh, I'll give a brief overview and then uh, Mr. Barker uh, will take over with the PowerPoint. Um, as you likely are aware, um, we have uh, substantial unfunded pension liability in this county. Um, CalPERS is our defined benefit uh, pension plan um, which handles both the miscellaneous and the safety plans for our county employees who are eligible to participate. Um, there have been changes in recent years. One of them was uh, the implementation of PEPRA back in 2013, which modified uh, the, con uh, 
the benefits um, for employees hired before that date as opposed to after that date. In addition, in 2016, the Board of CalPERS came out and announced um, a, a downward roll of the discount rate from 7.5% to 7% over a three-year period. Uh, the um, July 1 of 2018 will be when that new rate hits Calaveras County at 7.375%. The uh, practical ramifications of that um, alone is that the, um, the discount rate here being uh, the way to think about it as an assumed rate of return as opposed to it, uh, some of the other, well, the other primary discount rate model. Uh, so what that would mean is that the, on, uh, the, the, the funding obligations over the next five years are expected to approximately double. Um, this is huge, and so with a view towards um, an, an ultimate goal of diversifying and giving uh, the county more control over our investment pool um, and having another option other than sending additional funds to CalPERS, uh, looking at um, participating in the Section 19 irrevocable trust, the way the trust functions is that uh, it is irrevocable. We could choose to fund it. We could choose not to fund it. What we're asking today is simply to authorize CAO LETS to enter into the agreements necessary such that should the time come that the board wants to, uh, to fund that trust that we have this other alternative out there. Um, there would be no fees incurred in the meantime. Um, uh, it, it functions more or less like a mutual fund um, and we are going to turn it over to Mr. Barker here in a moment uh, so that he can give you a little bit more insight into what their fund does. Um, in any event, once the funding is made, uh, the, those funds could never be used for anything other funding pension obligations. So we could roll them into CalPERS, we could distribute them directly <coughs> to employees, who are entitled to those benefits at some future date, um, but the, that money would be permanently set aside um, for the unfunded obligations as they stand today. Mr. Barker. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Mitch Barker, Executive Vice President with PARS. Also with us today is uh, Mike Graves. He's our uh, county consultant and also former supervisor of uh, San Benito County and past president of CSAC. Um, we really appreciate the opportunity. You're already a client of ours in a program called the Social Security Alternative for part-time seasonal and temporary employees, those folks under 1,000 hours. Uh, we've been servicing you for some time. So this is the next step. Uh, now we're talking about full-time employees. Push this button here. Okay, very good. Um, just wanted to let you know who the partners are that will be bringing you this program. If you were to adopt PARs, we're known as trust administrators. We do the subtrust accounting. We do also the record keeping, and we also do the plan compliance. Gasby, who uh, controls governmental accounting, changes the rules periodically, as you know. 45 used to govern uh, OPEB. Now it's been replaced by GASB 75. GASB 68 controls pension, which is the main topic of the day. So we have to monitor all that and make sure everything stays uh, consistent. U.S. Bank is the trustee, so they're the actual custodian of the assets. They hold the money. It's in a walled-off trust. It's not accessible by creditors, uh, and that way it's protected and will be there for the benefit of your county employees in the future. Highmark Capital is our investment management partner. We've been working with them for 20 years. You need somebody that's licensed and experienced to do investments the right way. They listen to your risk tolerance level, and they will craft a strategy that, uh, that meets those requirements. So that is our team, and we've been working together for a long time. Uh, 21 counties have adopted our 115 trust that Krista spoke about to pre-fund either OPEB, also known as retiree medical benefits, or pension. Pension is certainly the most important topic of the day, and that's what virtually every county we're talking to uh, is wanting to discuss. So 21 counties, uh, and we would love to have number 22, my wife's favorite number, which Hopefully, it will be Calaveras County today or in the near future. Um, so here's the, the topic, most importantly, pension rate stabilization. Um, and here's the issue. As Krista mentioned, CalPERS has lowered the discount rate 
uh, also known as the assumed rate of return from 7.5 to 7%. Um, I've got kids and I've got grandkids and you may remember the teeter-totter on the playground. Uh, the teeter-totter effect is in place, <coughs> meaning when you lower the discount rate, what happens? The contribution rate goes up and the unfunded liabilities go up. So your numbers as of right now, if you were to look on the CalPERS website, because they run about a year behind posting, is a funded ratio of 70%. I congratulate you. The range we see is from 60 to 80. You're right in the middle. You're in a good place. But ideally, you want to take it a little bit higher over time. And most importantly, you want to deal with what's next. The employer contribution amount is 6.3 million this year. What will it be in seven years? That's the number below, 12.2 million, a 93.6% increase, which is pretty close to what Krista said. We see a lot of agencies and it's about 100% increase. Uh, why is that happening? Again, it's primarily related to that lowering of the discount rate from 7.5 to 7. That's just a half a point. Guess what? They're not done. They've talked about lowering the discount rate in the future, but at least they're phasing it in over three years, like she mentioned, and they're giving you forward-looking projections so that you can prepare. And we think our program gives you one of those fiscal tools you need to prepare. So graphically, let's look at the contributions uh, over time. The first slide is for miscellaneous. Your contribution amount will go from 4.6 million to 8.8 .8 million, about a 93% increase. You see on the vertical axis on the left what the percentage of payroll is. Some people think in terms of that, it will go from about 19% of payroll up to uh, about 29% of payroll. Again, that's miscellaneous. For safety, the contribution amount will go from 1.8 million this year to 3.4 million, which is a 95% increase. And the percent of payroll on the left will go from about 30% 30, 30 up to uh, a little over 49%. Awfully, awfully uh, strong numbers. So why does this possibly make sense for Calaveras County and, and why other counties have adopted this program? Number one, the money you put in, you have control over as to how much you put in, when you put it in, how much you take out, when you take it out, and what's the risk tolerance level. You control all of that. As Krista said, there's one restriction. The money can only be used for pension purposes. And that can either be used to reimburse the county, or if you said at some point in time, you know what, we just want to write a check to CalPERS and be done. You can do that at any point in time. Reimburse the county, send the money to CalPERS. Number two, it helps to offset pension rate increases or underperformance by the retirement system. Again, what are the pension rate increases due to? That lowering of the discount rate for underperformance by the retirement system. They had a good year last year, 11.2. Hats off to them. Previous year, 0. 0.6. Previous year, 2.4, not so good. So when they underperform, it comes back to the county to make up the difference, unfortunately. Setting money aside in this trust will help prepare you for those years when they underperform and you have to make up the difference. You can draw on our trust to help you. Rainy day fund. If the county has an emergency and there's a tight budget period of time and you need to access this money to pay your, pen, uh, your CalPERS bill, you may do that. Improved credit rating agencies, Standard & Poor's, Moody's & Fitch have all said, we love this program. Why? It's improving your balance sheet. You're setting money aside for future obligations. How could that be viewed any other way than positive? So they've been very, very uh, strong about that. Again, you can use the funds at any time for pension obligations. This addresses future pension liabilities, as discussed. You can choose a less aggressive investment strategy than the retirement system. As you know, with CalPERS, they have one. It's about a 75-25 strategy, 75% 75 stocks, roughly 25% bonds. We have five risk tolerance levels. And the most common I'm about to show you is the second one from the bottom which tells us two interesting things. One, they don't want the volatile ride of an aggressive strategy. And two, they're thinking shorter term. I may need the money in three to five years. Therefore, if I'm thinking shorter term, I don't want to 
swinging for the fences on my aggressive investment strategy. And number eight, and this one's very powerful, we're allowed to do diversified investing, which is basically saying we can put some percentage in stocks and some percentage in bonds. The money inside your general fund or your other fund is uh, subject to California Government Code 53601, which says you may not diversify the investments. You can only invest in fixed income items. Because why? You need that to pay the bills, the ongoing bills. So there should be no risk subject to the general fund. Our trust is outside of that. It's governed by 53216s, which says we may diversify investments. So here are the returns of the five strategies over one year, three year, and five years, starting with conservative at the bottom, which, by the way, excites me because most general funds we're talking to of agencies, including counties, are earning around 1 to 1.25%. You've got the ability, let's use the, uh, um, you know, the five-year number, 3.73, because last year was a gift, if you will, right? It was such a strong year. You could say, eh, I don't know how many more of those are coming. But over five years, you could say 3.73 for that conservative strategy, that's three times what your general fund is earning. So quite a good place to be. The most common one, as mentioned, is the second one up. That's moderately conservative. That's earned 5.26% over five years. Uh, that's the one I also like. Capital appreciation, the one at the top, is the one that's most closely aligned with CalPERS. Had a great year, 16.7%, and it's earned 10% over five years. But again, that's much more aggressive. That's much more risk. Don't recommend that necessarily for your strategy. Our fees are 0.25% of assets. Once you put money in, Krista made a key point. We've tried to do everything we can to make this as user-friendly as possible from the beginning. Therefore, there are no setup fees. So if you adopt now, but you don't put money in for a year or two years, no problem. Uh, we don't start charging a fee until you put money in. Um, again, for PARS fee, it's 0.25% of assets, and it goes down as the assets build. The uh, investment management fee below starts out at 0.35%. So collectively, we're at 60.60%. Um, they actually don't charge a management fee on money market funds because they're not earning anything. So morally, it's just almost impossible to charge that fund. Uh, so it actually winds up being about 58 basis points, also known as 0.58%. So that's our fee. But again, we don't charge it until you put assets in the trust. So reasons why we think this makes sense, again, you have an IRS-approved structure. We were the leader and the first provider to get this from the IRS. Over 125 agencies have adopted this program in California, including um, many counties. There are no startup costs. There are no minimum annual fees. There are no fees charged until assets in the trust. We have no trading fees, and we have no termination fees. If you put whatever the amount of money is, and in one year, three years, five years, you say, we're writing a check to CalPERS, all of it will say, thanks for the business, but there won't be a termination fee. It's just not how we do business. And then I've got the risk tolerance uh, strategies behind that in detail, but that was just there in case you had questions. That's my presentation. Mike and I are available for questions. Questions from the board? Thank you, Chair. For the benefit of the folks, TV land, the folks here, what is our deficit on our retirement system now with PERS as a county? CIO Lutz, do you have that number? It's right there. Right there, 66.9 six, mil? Right. Yes, sir. We yeah. owe that money. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, okay. Auditor controller Rebecca Callen. Um, and what we're finding when we're looking year over year at the actuaries that we're getting from CalPERS is it's increasing about $10 million per year. So it was around 56 ish uh, last actuary, most current actuary is 66.9. And we're seeing that occur because, um, as he had just stated, when um, the rates go up, we're basically um, increasing our unfunded uh, liability. 
So all of these changes that CalPERS has been making in order to kind of stabilize the funding of the, the pension portfolio itself is basically pushing those costs off to the employer. And um, two things are happening. It's increasing our normal costs that we're paying um, every single month. And then it's increasing the total unfunded liability. So we're seeing a dramatic increase. And so what's interesting is, you know, it's nice to hear that other agencies are um, between that 60 and 80 and we're kind of right in the middle, but it's a little um, depressing when you look at where we were um, and probably where everyone else was as well, which is we were, we were much more funded uh, a few years ago, but just as our unfunded liability is going up, our funded ratio is going down. And so we um, are seeing it just go down and down and down. And so it's concerning to me from a longevity perspective to continue to watch that funded ratio go down, unfunded liability go up, and not have a plan in place on how we're gonna counter that. So that's where we started having these discussions um, as part of the budget hearings that we need to start actively approaching this. And it's not a let's wait and see after a few years. After a few years, this is gonna look way worse. Um, and then we're not gonna have a plan. So this has absolutely been something that I've been pushing for for quite some time. Um, we do need to have an active strategy here. Um, it's, it's one tool that we can use and then continue the discussion on what else we can do for the long term. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Kellen. So we're not improving, are we? No. We're going downhill. Um, and not necessarily by our own doing. I mean, these, I are, all, these are all things that occurred years ago um, that we are now, unfortunately, bearing the consequences of. So we're 66.9 million plus in the next two years, correct? It will increase every year, yes. Okay. CAO Lutz, uh, on our last mid-budget, and I hate to beat this horse, how much money do we have in our cash and carry accounts? I remember that number being nine mil. Is that true? That is correct. That's We're projecting. I mean, that's a projection. So, if well, I have so a, you think the county has the money if, if to I continue could, in this if way? If I could add to, to your point, and I think where you're going, I, and I do think Thank it's you. a concern to say that we, the county, is, is going downhill when you look at the fact that this is a this is a statewide mm -hmm. problem of every single CalPERS county. I don't think there is one county out there that is is in the position to say we can address our unfunded liability in, in one false swoop. That's part of where we have these programs that are are developing um, because it is a tsunami that we we have the warning that we know it's coming, but it's how do you prepare for this tsunami? And I think. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, that's where we're going to start to see legislative action or other types of um, broader discussion because it is a, a massive unfunded um, problem that everybody's having the same questions and everybody has the same, um, the same fear. Now, I, I share that opinion wholeheartedly. I see this in uh, talking with the supervisors in CSAC and the other committees I belong to. But... To be quite frank, we need to tell our folks exactly what the situation is. And that is, we have a problem. Would you agree, Ms. Kellen, as being auditor? Yes, and, and so that's why we're having this discussion now. Um, and if, if you recall, it, this, is a, this is a discussion I have every single year at budget, um, at recommended, at final, uh, at any opportunity I ever get the opportunity to have this discussion, I, it's like a, I'm a broken record and I'm telling and have been telling the board, the bill is coming. <laughs> it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. So we're saying it's absolutely here. So we need to make, um, we, we need to make a move on figuring out how we're going to stabilize this. And this is no different than what every single ever PERS county and city jurisdiction, special district, we're all having these same discussions. Hopefully, they're all having those same discussions. But from what I'm, uh, from, from my colleagues, 
we're all in the same boat. So I guess the benefit is um, we're all in the same boat. Right. And the states, um, when you look at our unfunded liability, you know, of close to 70 million, imagine what the state of California is. That's what's gonna pressure a legislature. It's not going to be little Calaveras County's, you know, $70 million unfunded liability. It's the fact that this is a vast problem that we've all known is coming, um, that uh, there was some small steps undertaken under PEPRA, but didn't quite do enough to fix this. So I think that, you know, it's also talking to legislation, um, we're talking to CSAC, seeing what's out there, what, what else is going to be coming down the pipeline, because we can certainly locally do some things here, but there's kind of a much larger shift that has to occur, and we're limited um, in, in our response to that. Okay. And Ms. Callan, I remember you having those discussions when I first sat on this board, mm -hmm. and I can attest that you're absolutely correct in your statements that we are in trouble, and have been for a while. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ben. Didn't happen overnight. Absolutely. Did not happen overnight. Supervisor Mills, you have? And that is to the point is <clears throat> the problem in California with PERS didn't start last year. Yeah. Uh, this is a trajectory that's been going on literally for decades. Um, I, I bring you to a point of something just happened in my world yesterday, and that is, is that a corporation was had a portfolio that was close to that 60% mark. And so they made some very drastic changes in their benefits to try to bring themselves back up. Now they're back up and they're saying, okay, we're gonna go to what's called phase two. And they literally revamped the whole process and, and okay, some of us are now gonna see windfalls. But the point is that isn't going to be the case when we have, we're on a bigger train. And I think the auditor will tell you that. You know, we're, we're just along for the ride with a lot of these decisions that the state and other agencies are making. But to fully understand this liability, um, this liability is if we were to stop tomorrow, yes. this is the number we'd be at. And we would continue to need to fund these out year over year over year, probably 30 years, 40 years. That's what Gatsby does. It develops the actuarial table to show that you have the capacity to fund over a longer period of time. So this is just that moment, that snapshot in time. This is where you are. If you stop tomorrow, this is how much you'd need to go out 20 or 30 or 40 years. Don't look at this as being, we just created this debt today. It didn't go that way. Um, it's important to understand too is, is that LAFE is currently at what? Local agency funding. I would say 1.25%. Yeah, I was thinking it was a little sure. higher than that. But anyway, you know, the, the point still is, is that's a ridiculously low, low number. It's almost like we're giving money to play with and we're not getting anything for it. But then again, if you loan money to a bank, how much are they going to give you as well? It's even worse. So uh, it's interesting. We talk about lowering the discount rate and what effect that has to everyone and the detrimental effect because it affects across a broad spectrum. So these, these are very perilous times, so to speak, in terms of how we're gonna fund going forward if they continue in this trajectory of getting down into that goal, I think they have of 6.75%. If they actually go there, that's gonna really upset the apple cart. And everybody needs to understand that's serious. We think reduce the discount rate, somehow that's a benefit, it's not. I mean, you really have to understand how this all works. So uh, I, I appreciate the time that you spent with us as an ad hoc committee and the information you've given to us, I think it's up to this board to decide if they want to take this first step and whether or not we have the ability and the willingness to want to, want to do that. So thank you. I, I have a question. Um, can you go back to the table that showed the investment returns? Yes. Um, you are charging a fee and I assume it's a yearly fee based on the amount we have in the fund that you were showing, the 0.25 or 3.5 or whatever. It's taken monthly, so it'd be monthly. assets times the fee divided by 12. Okay. Those return investment numbers up there that you're showing is it, using uh, the funds that we deposit. 
is that the entire investment return or is PARS giving us a portion of the entire investment return and then taking um, a percentage off of those numbers for these your funds? These returns are reported net of fund level fees, meaning the mutual fund fees or the uh, exchange traded funds. Mm -hmm. uh, they're a gross of management fees. And that's why we had that separate slide that showed what those were. So to get a true net number, mm -hmm. you would take 0.60 mm -hmm. on a, on a yeah, broad basis. I just basis. wanted to clarify that. Yep. So, yeah. So, Correct. Yeah. And we do it that because that's industry convention, mm -hmm. but we wanted to. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted some clarification. On yes, sir. Okay. Any other board questions? Uh, we'll open up for public comments. Any public questions or comments? Alice Gallant, Taxpayer Association, and my compliments for an excellent presentation. And also a big thank you to our, our uh, controller auditor uh, for the good work she's been doing, not just now, but all each year. And uh, too bad we didn't pay closer attention to what she's saying. Um, money's got to come from somewhere. Okay, you're either going to take it from the taxpayers uh, or you're going to uh, take it from the employees or retirees or some combination of the above. I don't know any other source where this money would come from. Uh, we, we have to do catch up. I think this is what this is about. So part of the problem in increasing the expense to the employer has been the negotiations that you've been doing with the unions. In other words, um, You've been making agreements with the unions that would increase the costs for the employer. Um, it looks like these negotiations will need to take a different, a different turn. Um, it's very hard to, if we're going to ask the employees to, um, to contribute, in solving a problem which is theirs, um, it, ha it has to be done through the, in this negotiation process. I don't know any other way to do it. And uh, so you'll need to have a conversation about that. And again, thank you for an excellent presentation. Any other public comment? George Fry. <clears throat> Great presentation. I'm very impressed. I've been retired 22 years from the state of California, and I'm enjoying my retirement every minute. Um, also, we probably have the best auditor we could have, and she does an outstanding job. And some of the folks on the board almost scared her away, and she wasn't going to run again. I'm glad she's running, and I hope she spends many more years here. Thank you. Any other public comments? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board. Oh, you have comments? CAO Letts. Yeah, and I just wanted to add um, to it as well, depending on, on what the board decides today. I think what, what we would ideally see on something like this is um, this, you know, as the auditor alluded to, this is one step or one option for us um, that the ad hoc committee looked at. There's still a lot of work, I think, on, on the ad hoc committee to um, look at strategies across the board. But for this particular plan, um, the next steps, if the board were to adopt this, would be to really look at how we want to staff this at a committee level, like we have our treasury oversight committee or a finance committee um, really looking at what the funding strategy would be for um, the conservative, moderately conservative, et cetera. And as a, as a going forward basis, looking at, you know, internally, what funds would we use to actually fund this? Right now we have um, within a designated fund, a, a retirement pre-funding that we've been, um, that we've set aside in the past that would be an, an easy option to look at, but 
that's one-time funds as a going forward basis. Some of the strategies we could be looking at is, do we take 1% of general funds or 5% of general funds? Do we um, start to, if we sell capital assets, put a portion of that um, into the, um, the 115 plan? There are a lot of options that we can consider that would have to be brought back to the board and implemented as a, as a county policy. Um, so I, and I bring this up just to assure the board that um, this wouldn't be a one-time done, we, we move on. There's a lot of, of work and active engagement that we um, would be looking at for this. I'm ready. <laughs> I think it's important too that, uh, as you alluded to, there's a lot of policy discussion that's gonna to have to surround any kind of decision like this. Um, I would even like to look at, for instance, at mid-year, we had salary savings of 2.18 million. Not to say you take that full amount, but if some of that could be earmarked and pulled across into an account like this, it, it is going to serve its intended purpose. So those are policy discussions I think the board needs to have as to how they want to fund this account and, and to what level of risk that they want to take in that funding. Uh, but that's to come at a later point. This is an action item asking whether we want to enter into this agreement with PARS. It's not going to cost us anything to open the account um, until we start putting funds into it. So we're looking for a motion um, of some type to enter into this agreement. I would move to enter into the agreement. I have a motion by Supervisor Mills. Do I have a second? I'll second, Mr. Chair. I have a motion by Mills and a second by Oliveira. Call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Passes 401. And we will be breaking for lunch now, and we will be coming back at 145. 145.